Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texas Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texas Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50 ball, I got to come down with. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. So I'm still kind of hoping for chaos because of this Jim Harbaugh to the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, I don't think we're going to get the chaos that I was kind of hoping for, but it will open up the portal. Welcome into Texas Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour, presented by The Warehouse at CC Creations. I'm David Nuno. My partner over here is Olam Buchanan, and this is what we call Coffee Talk, presented by Texas Ags Coffee. Beat the hell out of the morning by going to texags.com slash coffee i'm enjoying myself a little texax coffee as we speak ob good morning uh good morning yeah you are enjoying that coffee you took a big pretty, drink pretty good i haven't done that in a while cubans like to drink coffee yeah we do yeah, yeah we do yeah lot. you can paint us with that same brush i'm okay with it that's it, that's that's a good good thoughts it's true though isn't it yeah it's very true yeah did you when we were in miami did you have cuban coffee or no i don't drink coffee but not even a little i don't drink any coffee nothing are you a, is it because I don't like it? Okay, that, that'd be that'd be why. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the only reason. Beer. Rarely do I drink beer. Do you like it? Not really. Do people actually like beer? Oh yeah, some people love like beer. like oh it tastes oh, yeah. good. Really? Yeah. Huh. My wife, for instance, she loves beer, huh. but not me. This is where I alienate half the audience because they're like, this guy doesn't even drink beer. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I don't do, I don't do anything. Hey, let's uh, let's get back on on topic here. Hardball to the Chargers. Yeah. I wanted this scenario where, like, the SEC, like, has all these changes. LSU, which, by the way, we went through their schedule yesterday, and they've got not a cakewalk schedule, but a very manageable schedule very with manageable. all the changes that they are having. But some of the love that Nussmeyer's getting in these— it's, Yeah, I would pump the brakes just a little bit. There. He might be great. He might be. But I don't think it's fair. <clears throat> we'll get to that in a moment because I— you know, like Graham Mertz getting more love than Connor. I, Como, por qué? I celebrate that. I want to have that stealth quality. I want to fly a little bit under the radar yeah. and have people uh, uh, un- underestimating A&M. Look, Graham Mertz, by, you know, he's always in his career been able to put up a lot of yards. His issues always throws a lot of interceptions. I think last year he was really good with it, though. Yeah. I think he had uh, three or four interceptions, I think. But – Throughout his career, that's been the big yeah. knock on him. Um, as far as Nussmeyer goes, if you want to judge him based on what he did against a really, really mediocre Wisconsin or in the second half last year of a Georgia team that already had the game won, so they're, you know, right. they're okay. Fine. I think we have more evidence when it comes to Connor. But – the, the dominoes that we're talking about, looks like Brian Kelly's not a real candidate for the Michigan job. He's, not, he's listed, I think, on um, our buddy from CBS Sports. Who am I thinking of? Um, Dennis Dodd. Dennis Dodd. He might have been his. One of the guys at CBS Sports, I think it's Dennis Dodd, he was listed as a, still a potential candidate, but ESPN did not list Brian Kelly. I was thinking of this scenario where BK actually does go there, and then there's chaos with LSU, and I, I'm here for it just because we're seeing a little bit of chaos with Bama, right? Mm-hmm. Not as much. You I know, think we've seen quite a bit of chaos with Alabama. But they, they, they got Ryan Williams yesterday to, to commit. That's, okay. that's a nice. But they're going to get players because they're Alabama. But some of the names out there to go through them that are being mentioned, at least through ESPN, um, Sean Moore, the uh, offensive coordinator, the problem with him, and I don't think there's a problem, but if they're already losing all these guys to the portal anyway, does it behoove you to keep him? Well, you just want a national championship. Yeah. So, I mean, if you can't ever reward a guy on staff after they won a national championship and you had a big role in it, then when can you? But all those guys are gone. So, but um, 
You've got Lance Leopold. You probably Leopold. helped get those guys. Yeah, yeah. Lance Leopold. Okay. 60-something-year-old guy from Kansas. Kleiman. Or Kleeman. Kleiman. Kleiman, right? From Kansas State. Kansas State, yep. Okay. Clawson, Wake Forest. That's a good coach. Yeah. Matt Rule. Yeah, he's really doing a bang-up job at Nebraska. And Luke Fickle. I like Luke Fickle. I know he didn't have a great year, but I, I like Luke Wasn't Fickle. Wasn't he an Ohio State guy? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that might. I think that might be too much for a Michigan. Um, Those are the names being mentioned. The horse that I'd bet on in that race, Trumbull. Yeah, yeah. If if Kelly's not going to be a factor, do Kelly you, makes a lot of sense to me. Do you think they make that call though? It makes a lot of sense to me. He's from that area. He's had a lot of success in that area. Wasn't it like Central Michigan? Yeah. Um, uh, Cincinnati, Notre Dame, you know, uh, and, and the word is, and I'm talking about reading the word and hearing what other people say. So I don't know that, that he's not ex- exactly thrilled with Baton Rouge and wouldn't mind getting out. Huh? That's the word. Well, if you're going to leave, this would be the time, right? You're yeah. I mean, if, if two top 10 picks, uh, potential top 10 picks, the bot, the bottom line is. We live in a world of college football. It doesn't matter if you win a national championship. If you go five and seven, you're going to have people go in the portal. Michigan's already got people in the portal or going to the NFL, and more will probably follow. And, of course, next year, <laughs> our Texas audience that likes to listen, you're going to catch <laughs> Michigan probably. Not the Michigan that we've no, seen the last no, few no, years. I see the Michigan you saw today but uh, or this year. So, uh yeah, Longhorns are going to get a break because that's that's going to be a a shell of the national championship yeah, team. A shell, and they'll get. I think they'll get a pretty good Georgia team, pretty darn good Georgia yeah, team. Yeah, yeah, they're going to have top a Georgia. five Georgia team at that point, probably. the The question I'll have about Georgia this year is, um, what are they? We, we saw Georgia be. I don't want to say. I mean, they're obviously still really good, but we saw them be vulnerable when. McConkey and Bowers were injured. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to be when they're just not even there? You're exactly right. And then that that big nasty offensive line they've had for three years, you know, guys like Cedric Van Pran are gone. You know, they're going to be in the NFL. Do they rinse and repeat? Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe not. I'm, they're going to be good. Don't get me wrong, but are they going to be? The favorite to win the national championship. Well, who will be the favorite, you think? Ohio State? Looks like it. Texas, Ohio State. I hate to say it. I don't want to say it. Ole Miss looks really good. Ole Miss is in that mix, yeah. 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 Oregon looks good. Oregon looks really good. Yeah, they do. Uh, So, so, but there's going to be some Michigan players that enter the portal, and our portal king, Mike Elko, maybe will have uh, his ear to the grindstone. Maybe. if they have. uh, I can't remember his name right now. But Michigan has a war horse defensive lineman that's still going to be there. I mean, if that guy was available, I wish I could remember his name. If he was available, yeah, he'd be worth uh, a, a, a really good NIL deal. <laughs> hey, uh, back to that topic where we're talking about like Connor and I getting love, and we can go through that list here in a minute. Uh, I shouldn't bring up too many of these list things. Cause I should probably, but you see, SEC Mike is a uh, win. Projections for uh, 2024? I have not. I'm going to go through them. I'm going to make A&M last. Okay? okay. You know, two years ago, he was very down on Texas A&M for mm-hmm. Jimbo Fisher reasons. Last year, he started the season very high, and I think they burned him, so he'll never be high again. We'll see how he has this. Projected over and under for uh, SEC teams in 2024. You tell me if you agree okay. or, or over and under. Alabama, nine. Uh, I would always still take the over, but uh, I wouldn't feel as... That is the slam dunk that it typically is. Arkansas, five. I'm gonna take I would have over. to look at their, their schedule because they probably have four non-conference wins. Yep. So I'll take the over. Auburn, seven. Man, we're acting, there's, Auburn's getting a lot of love. They are getting a lot of love. For a team that's... Is seven a lot of love? Well, I mean, I'm being, I hear... Not yeah. with that, I hear a lot of talk about how much better Auburn's going to be. And I'm like... Why? Is Peyton Thorne still their quarterback as of right now? I'm sure they've found somebody to move on from Peyton Thorne. You know what? I'm going to say, again, I don't know their schedule, but 
I'm going to say I would take uh, seven to me sounds about right. Okay. So uh, do, is that an option? Does it have to be over or under? You, yeah, just tell me whatever you think. Uh, I'll say seven sounds right to me. He's got Florida's line at six. I would take the under. <laughs> yeah. George at 11. You're going to take the under, aren't you? But close. 11. I, yeah. You see two losses in their future. Uh, again, I'd have to – I haven't really – they go to Texas. So what? Um, I would take the over. Okay. No, I would, I'd say just right. Just right. Kentucky 7. I wish I knew the schedule. I know they play Louisville, and I don't know what Louisville I think 7 be. sounds like a good number Sound, for them. Yeah, they might be under. All right. LSU, 9. Yeah, we talked about it yesterday. Yeah, I'd take the yeah. over. For, yeah, because of their schedule. Yeah. Okay. Oklahoma, 8. Got I know you got another schedule. This is just quick thoughts. Yeah, uh, under. Okay, under. Under yeah. eight. Oh, because they're entering the SEC. This is true. Ole Miss, this number was interesting to me. Nine. Oh, over. I'm taking long. the over too, buddy. Mississippi State, cinco. Five. Five? Yeah, for my general audience. General market. <laughs> I'm going to say it sounds about right. Yeah. If I had to take one or the other, I'd take the under. Okay. Why are they going to be any better? Well, okay, they did they had get a better rid- coach. Yeah, their co- that coach was a complete buffoon. Buffoon. And they lost. He defines yeah. buffoon. Missouri, nine and a half. I don't know their schedule, but I might take the over. I'm going to take the under. Okay. I, look, One hit wonder? Still good, but a step back. Okay. And then, then our defensive coordinator is down at LSU now, right? This is right. South Carolina. Under. What is it? Five and a half. <laughs> under. Wow. Tennessee, eight and a half. Under. Okay. I'm going to skip A&M. Texas, 10. I think Un- that's about right. Under. Are you going nine? Yeah. Okay. I hope. Like I've said it before, that game that you squirreled out and, and got, uh, and I'm talking directly to you, Texas fans, that game you squirrel, squirreled out and beat Houston on a really bad, botched officials play, and when you escaped Wyoming with a backup quarterback and – uh, Kansas State was right on the on the brink of beating you, and so yep. was TCU. Those are the games that when you don't show up 100% in the SEC, you lose those games. Yep. Uh, I'm going to give you A&M now. Okay. According to SEC Mike, if you were to guess what he thinks the number is. Probably seven. It is seven. Yeah. Seven is what they did last year. Yeah, I'm going to take the over. I'm but, a, a, don't I always take the over? But if you can get seven, listen, I've talked to some guys who were on the team last year, and they were telling me some of the dysfunction, and it's alarming. It's alarming. It's alarming that stuff that I didn't even – I mean, I knew there was dysfunction, but then when I heard, heard some the former more, play, yeah. I'm like, holy cow, how did they win seven games? And by the way, this wasn't just a one-year thing. This was several years of dysfunction. Of dysfunction. So when I hear that and I see, okay, despite all that – they won seven games, despite all that. Yep. They got to be better than it. that. And they won seven games despite all that with a backup quarterback. With several with a third backup. string quarterback. Yeah. I just believe they'll be better I do than too. they were. I do too. And I will this place riot if they're a seven win team? I think Mike Elko's first year. There's going to be more grace, obviously. But you were a seven win team last year. You've got to be better because I don't think there's been a drop off in talent, Ob. Not not a drastic one. In fact. Some of the guys that left, as talented as they are, I don't care. Well, this is how I look at like, it. Like, like, all right, I'm going to talk. I'm going to say the name Evan Stewart. We keep hearing how great Evan Stewart is when he when and, he played and, and caught and, two passes. When, yeah. when he played, and, but you know what? I keep going back to the pass against Miami when he has a touchdown yeah. and he's too soft to try to make a move. No, I'm not going to turn up field and try to score. I'm going to dance and give up a first down. Now, did he make a big catch on the sideline against Arkansas? Sure. Is he talented? He is. He can. But can you rely on him? So, do, does A and M need to get better at receiver? Yeah, yeah, they do. But if you had Evan Stewart, that's great. But is he going to play? Is he going to play? It, is he going to have a bruise and say, "Well, I can't play"? For is two he going to go on social media and do little eye things or just ask for drama? And I'm done with that kind of world. I'm done with it. All right. And Walter Nolan, as good as he is. I think your defensive line is pretty darn strong. Here's what I come back with Walter Nolan, too. And, you know, look, is he talented? Yes. And he can be dominant when he wants to be. You, you, we were there at Tennessee. 
Remember, they're taking him off the field on the cart, and it's like I'm thinking, is the guy ever going to walk again? How he looks so hurt, you know? I mean, it was. It yeah, was, it I was thought he was done. I thought he was done. I heard he was walking on the up and down the plane on the way back, like nothing's happened, and then he played the next week. Well, I, I think where I come on on this Evan and Walter thing is where were your areas of deficiency last year? Are we significantly better at uh, defensive backs? It looks that way. It looks that way. As of today, I'd say upgrade. Okay? Offensive line. Just by changing the Adazio era. Upgrade. And that's E-R-R-E-R-R-O-R. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. The Adazio era. Uh, some of the things I heard that was alarming dealt with the offensive okay. line. And in fact, the most alarming things I heard dealt. So, uh, I think I know who you talked to. I, I expect. Pablo? I expect them to. I'm not gonna. I promised I wouldn't. I would <laughs> never reveal I'm his. I'm totally kidding. I know you are, but um, I would expect they will at least be better. They may be significantly better. They yeah. may be monumentally better. Dramatically. And, Pick your adjective. And I know it sounds like um, what's the the term whenever we talk about somebody leaving that you don't really right right. Yeah. Look, I would rather Evan be here if he's healthy and part of the squad i would rather walter be here if it's if it's if everyone's getting along and it's a great culture but if not and you're upgrading in other areas okay see you have fun i i am done with i, I was gonna call it five-star drama it's not five-star drama because there's a lot of five-star just dudes David in the locker, Hicks. right there you go DJ Hicks. i'm done with drama right done right you want a different era when you come from drama, you want something completely different. I want, I want military school over there. That's what I want. Well, that's not happening, you know. But but you, you know but what I'm saying. There's every there's so many things about A and M that, and I've written about it before. And we've discussed it, yeah. just about the influence that Mike Elko's already had in terms of guys he hired, in terms of guys he fired, um, in terms of guys he brought in. That uh, seven wins, yeah, I would I would bet the over on that. Confidently, I would too. Uh, by the way, the last couple of years, I'm sorry, even with some of the issues across the street and the many issues that we haven't even said, if Connor's healthy, and that's a big if, they win more than seven games, they win more than five games if Connor plays two years ago before he came in, and they win more last year if he stays healthy. That's a fact. I don't know how I can make it a fact because you can't relive the moments. But I think Connor Wigman is that level of quarterback that, yeah, he struggled in the first half of the Auburn game. They would have figured it out. Everybody was going to – I mean, I've seen great quarterbacks struggle struggle for half, and then you make adjustments. So, yeah. uh, look, I, I, yeah, I feel good about – I would feel good about taking the over on the seven. I would. Yeah. Now, they're going to say, okay, you're going to lose to Notre Dame. They're going to say you're going to lose to Texas. They're going to say you're going to lose to LSU. They're going to say you're going to lose to uh, Auburn. Um, right. Well, then you're not as well. There, are, but, but yeah, you know they're going to probably say you're going to lose to Missouri. I wouldn't call it an easy schedule. Sam Man says it. I, I don't think it's an easy schedule. I think it's very manageable because you have your big games at home. You got true. LSU at home. You've got Texas at home. You, and Notre Dame. There is no easy schedule and, in the SEC. And Missouri. Dang, you do have them all. At home. But they're all really. I mean, based on what they did last year, Notre Dame is a proud program. Uh, I think A&M should win that game. Going to Florida, I, I think you win that game. Um, well, Arkansas, Notre Dame's they're come here as a top 10 rated program, but well, they always do. I went, A&M would not be ranked, right? Y- years ago, I went to see Notre Dame at Texas, right? You know, remember the Texas is back. What's that? Doofus is always. Uh, oh, uh, Charles Davis? No, no, no. He was the. Uh, <sighs> I don't. I can't remember his name. He was the guy that called the game for ESPN. He goes, "Texas is back" because they beat a bad Notre Dame team. It was the second game of the year. Not a test tour, was it? Yeah, I think it was. Oh, that's my buddy. Uh, I well, like that guy. Yeah, I'm a, I think Texas went maybe five that's and seven buddy, that year. By the way, he wouldn't know who I am if I walked up to him. Anyway, uh, we've got 19 oh, minutes. There we go. I did it but it was good. It was a good 19 minutes. We have not said hello to the people. We haven't like. Checked in text messages. If you want to be a part of the conversation, all you got to do is call us up at 979-693-1150. We will pick it up on the Brian Foley Law hotline. You can text us at that same number as well, 979-693-1150. Before we go around the room and say hello to the people, we should probably hit a break because we went 20 minutes. My bad. You know what? Louie, send your complaints right there. Guilty. 
It was worth it. You know what? We break rules here at TechSax. I've always been a rule breaker. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, let's just talk about Fargo's, all right? Uh, that's where you want to go and break well, some rules. Well, I mean, I, I brought lunch today, yeah. but there was a chance that, the, you know, this is how I work, Thursday. just so you know, all right? I, 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 the night before, I've either cooked, I've meal prepped for the week, yeah. and I haven't in a while, in a while, like a week or two. But leftovers, I start getting the leftovers in the container before, because my boys, all they do is they see food and they just take it, right? So I, I think ahead, I put it in the container. So, so your kids can't eat? Correct. Okay. Not overeat. Oh, I want them okay. to eat more, but just leave me a little bit of the protein, you want right? to keep them hungry. So I got lucky this morning, but there was a moment I was like, I don't see the food. I think the boys got it. And it was there. But had it not, I already had the plan in place. Plan. Thursday, I'd go get a pork chop. A- and some macaroni and cheese. Oh, man. Because right that's in my, what in my face. I'd actually, it. they'll give you two pork chops, and you can get them either way. You can get them grilled or fried. I'm more on the grilled team. Uh, you know, I like them both that way. Yeah. You know, but, you know, if I'm trying to be a little healthier, I tell myself it's healthier to, do, to eat the, the grilled one. Yeah. I grew up eating fried pork chops, but those are, you know, uh, I, I, if, I, if I went there today, I might get the fried pork chop. I'd definitely take advantage of the macaroni and cheese. Definitely gra- jump on that. Well, I love going to Fargo's. I love going with you to Fargo's. I like going by myself, you know, because every time I go, there's somebody I know at Fargo's. It's, well, like, it's like Cheers. Yeah, every, and, and, they, and they know your name. Everybody knows your name there, OB. <laughs> they don't know me. They know you. They know my initials. OB. Yeah. Do you think they know it's old? Uh, maybe, but I'm, I'm just OB, I'm, which is fine because they don't, you know, they used to put an S before that. 1701 South Texas Avenue in Bryan, without a doubt, the what? The best barbecue in Texas, i.e. the entire galaxy. That's your trademark because guess what? It's true. You broke the table. It's Fargo's.
Tex Hags Radio, presented by who, OB? CC Creations. No? I mean, well, they're David, a presenting sponsor of yeah, the Go Hour. Well, we got Rollo Insurance. Oh, I love We've that. got David Gardner's Jewelers. Oh, God, I love them, We've too. We've got CC Creations. <laughs> Bro. We've got Tex Hags Coffee. How is that doing, by the way? It's pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty. That's twice today I've done the Larry Dave. Hey, uh, I'm going to read you this text on the YouTube page before we go around the room because I, I want to ask you, uh, where did it go? Randy Etheridge, who's a Texas fan. Okay. And uh, is Randy having a baby soon? No. Somebody's having a baby soon, by the way. Derek Henry. Derek, uh, congratulations having a baby later on today. But Randy wants to know, so OB, mm-hmm. is Texas back? Oh, they were back this year. Yeah. Yeah. But when when – Tessator said that they weren't back. In fact, like I said, I think they went five and seven. I was talking about that year. Yeah. But if, you know, I mean, and that was five, six years ago. In fact, in fact, you've changed coaches since then. So you got back this year. You weren't back then. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, go around the room and say hello. Good gosh, Randy. He, I, I, he may, I just cha- used that tone to but, get you going. But, he yeah. might have meant it in a, hey, OB, so are we finally back? Like, he may have been asking That's, that's probably exactly the way I would. I mean, Obi, I, I, I trust your opinion, OB. Are, they, are we back, buddy? No, I used to cover it. the Longhorns. You know, I do for two, two years. I feel like you were in Austin a lot. I was longer. in Austin for 11 years. I covered uh, the Longhorns for two. Two of the longest years of your life. No, it was great. They won the championship that year? Uh, they almost went to the national championship game, but Mac Brown started – Phil, uh, Chris Sims instead of um, Major Applewhite. Ah, uh, Chris. Actually, he's pretty good on TV. I think Chris is, does a pretty good job doing a pro football talk. You think so? I think he's all right. All right. You don't like him? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do it again. He was a nice kid, though. Well, you know who's nice? Uh, Nick Savage. Yeah, I think Nick is nice. Listen, uh, hi, yeah. to Nick. hi, Nick. Good morning, hi, buddy. Good morning. Sorry it's been 38 minutes. It's okay. I, I'm kind of falling asleep you know it's like so we didn't we didn't entertain you no that's not what i'm saying let me get to that win total i'm gonna push back a little bit on what ob said about the missouri tigers of all teams and listen to this schedule and i think ob you just might want to change your pick to that it was a nine over i think not a half half. 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 this (laughs) so they have to win 10 okay yeah and they're going to okay murray state all right buffalo two boston college three vanderbilt four four. at a m loss okay i'm hoping how are you picking that one umass how are you picking the a&m game that's going to be a good missouri team coming in so, so you're saying missouri I would, wins yeah so, so you got missouri, six right now eight. uh Interesting. umass okay that's five auburn wins. okay six what is it? seven six seven whatever here's their first loss at alabama okay i don't know home oklahoma okay at south carolina that's a win okay mississippi state okay arkansas yeah, yeah, they're, they're, uh, that sounds good. I think they. Uh, they're gonna win ten. Uh, I think they're gonna. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna stick with the under. Wow. So you think they lose to A and M, Alabama, and one of the uh, some other team? Well, you know, you. How many times do we see it in the in the SEC where if you're not on your game every game, you go in there and there's an p- opponent that you're not supposed to lose to and you lose to. Yeah. So you're saying that Missouri's never gonna have that game. They're never going to have that game. They're going to, you're saying they're going to lose at Alabama, and every other game, they're going to be 100% on. I'm not buying. Teams like Missouri and even teams like A&M, and you got to do it multiple years in a row for me to give you the benefit of the doubt of those games. Teams that do it multiple years in a row, I then look at those games like, oh, I can see them losing that one, winning those games. And they, they've, they've done it once. Right. And you know where, where they uh, – well, they're so good last year in their passing game. Mm-hmm. Their defense wasn't very good, but they're passing. And I don't know what they've lost or gained in the portal. And I know they got their quarterback back and burden back and all. So that's their offense will be legit. They come down here, they're going to have a uh, much better defensive backfield to deal with than A and M had last year. Did you know that? I think Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. I do. I've, I've gathered there many times. I've ba- gathered there with you. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Callie Garner's with us. Hello, Callie. Your mic's not on. Boom. I had a note to turn it on. And Hello. I still didn't turn it on. Welcome to the team. How are you? I am fantastic. How are y'all? Doing wonderful. So give us a little bit about you. How did you get the tech sags? I um, am from College Station originally. I was born and raised here. I've heard about tech sags since I was young. Um kind of just been 
into sports my whole life. Um, I've watched the Tex Ags radio show um, for a few years, and I've um, just kind of reached out and wanted to join the team, and I'm happy to be here. Well, we're happy you're here, and uh, rumor has it, OB, her grandmother watches us daily. <laughs> That's the rumor. What's, what's your grandma's name? Grace. Grace. What do you call her? We need some Grace around here. <laughs> What do you call Grace? Oh, she's Nana to me. Nana. Well, Grace, Nana, thank you so much for being a loyal watcher and uh, listener to this program. And uh, Callie, let's get some news, shall we? We shall. Um, so we'll start with men's basketball. We're hosting um, Chris Beard and Ole Miss this weekend. Uh, Ole Miss started out really hot. They were 13-0 and um, prior to conference play. Uh, their first loss came to Tennessee, and they are undefeated at home, so we're happy to have them in Reed Arena this weekend. I think the Ags can get it done. Um, women's basketball plays Missouri tonight, and we are 5-5 five and five in the last 10 matchups with Missouri, so looking to take, take the lead in that one. Absolutely, and I, I, I have belief. I have trust in the Joni Mitchells. Joni Mitchells, Joni, excuse Joni me. Taylor. Joni Taylor. I did you what you did yeah. two years ago. Yeah, uh, Joni Taylor. Joni I Taylor. have a lot of trust in her. Yeah, I do too. She's a good coach. Callie, what else do you have for us? Track and field is at the Razorback Invitational this weekend in Fayetteville. <laughs> yeah. That was a little more than you normally do. Pink suey. <laughs> I usually do a squealing pig. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm used to. Yeah. I feel like that pig is really struggling. It, but have you seen what's going on up in Fayetteville? Well, this is true. Callie, <laughs> continue, please. <laughs> I've got a cousin that goes to Arkansas, so we've got a – a pretty big rivalry there. Um, there are nine SEC schools at that Invitational and then three Big 12 schools. Um, men's tennis is in Atlanta this evening playing Georgia Tech. They are 1-0 on the year. They defeated UCLA last week. Um, our women's tennis team hosts the ITA kickoff weekend this weekend. They play Northwestern on Saturday. And they also welcome TCU and Rice. Um, and they'll play the winner of that match or the loser, depending on how the Northwestern match goes. Good stuff there, Callie. Thank you very much. We'll be checking in with you momentarily here on the program here in a little bit. Let's, By the way, wait, yeah, tell so, me. so our man Richard Zane Rick, was Ricardo. always looking stuff up for us. Birthday, birthday Zane? Yesterday, it sure was. Um, so he just uh, texted me saying, it was Tessator in 2016 that said, Texas is back, folks. And that year, Texas went 5-7 and seven with a loss to Kansas. They've changed coaches twice since there. And that Notre Dame team finished 4-8 and eight with losses to Duke and Navy. Oh, good times. And they were back. So, there you go, Randy. Well, they, they do got a lot of talent. They do. They do. Like, they're, they're going to be legit. I, no, I, I haven't. Yeah, I know. You I have, just I'm said just that when you go – and they escaped some games this year that you won't get out of that trap if right. you show up that way in the SEC because it's more competitive week to week. Yep. Absolutely. All right, let's uh, hit a break here. When we come back, Esteban McGee will be joining us. But right now we're talking Heritage Films. You want a documentary film done about your family, you might be thinking to yourself, why would I do that? Like, well, there's a couple reasons you want to do it. Like, the, I'll give you our reasons. We did it with my dad because I have, especially as I've gotten older, zero recall. Right? I, I remember things that I shouldn't remember, like uh, the 1988 Oakland A's starting lineup, like this weird, or the Oilers of 93. Uh, but a lot of the recent stuff, I don't remember. But when my dad would tell me stuff about his time in Cuba and meeting my mom and all that stuff, I like remember parts of it, but I can't tell it the way he tells it. So luckily, I teamed up with Chance McLean, who does Heritage Films, and we did a documentary on my dad's life. Two-hour documentary, by the way, like legit movie style, music, like the editing, the whole thing is phenomenal. And now my kids know the story better because, yeah, they've heard it from him. But as they get older, they can watch this video and really understand where our family started. That's one of the reasons. You can do many reasons. If you've got a family ranch, you want to kind of talk about when you got that land and what it means to your family. you got a family business. Chance can do all of that better than anyone out there. So that, that's one part of what Chance does with Heritage Films. He's also got a different product called the Year Flicks. And the Year Flicks is an awesome, awesome product because what he does with that is he does these 20-minute videos that are more get-to-know videos um, of your kids, right? So Callie's first day here at Tech Sacks. It would be kind of cool to talk about her freshman year in a 20-minute video, all the things she went through, and then maybe her first day at Tech Sacks, and then when she graduates, and maybe even later, uh, her first job, right? These 20-minute get-to-know videos, but they're fun, and um, they're just 
more of a benchmark video where your kid is in life. You should check out the website, yourheritagefilm.com, yourheritagefilm.com, Hey, welcome back. Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. OB, uh, we're still waiting on Stephen. We'll see if we get him on here in a moment. But there's a, uh, a topic we haven't hit. There's not a lot, a lot to get into it, but I think with all this projections of how many wins this team and that team would have, uh, A&M spring football game announced yesterday, April the 20th. April 20th. So is that Saturday the 20th? Probably. Does that mean, uh, does that mean Muster's going to be on the 22nd? Probably. Is it always on the 22nd? I thought it was 21st. I don't know. Well, 22nd. As, as a, for this particular spring game, take me back to Jimbo's first spring game, okay? Oh, yeah. And maybe Sumlin's first spring game. The intrigue and the excitement level because of the new era. I wasn't here for Sumlin's spring, okay. first spring game. Um, I remember on Jimbo's, they threw a pass to, uh, I think it was Jace Sternberg, and the place erupted. Kyle Field had a nice, real nice crowd, and it erupted. And he was t- later. He's asked, well, "What's the big deal?" Someone said, "Well, they threw to a tight end. They, they don't throw the tight end here for for years." Uh, so it was very positive. It was so full of optimism, and 
people like what they saw and yeah and it was going to it was a good it was a good um omen for what would happen in the next 3 years unfortunately he was here six right <laughs> but it did give you hope for the next three years and that hope you know seemed to seem to be justified and seemed to be uh, rewarded for three years well that was part of my convo yesterday uh with max um who was in here and we were we were talking a little bit about just max right yeah, max right sorry yeah I mean, we're on a first name basis bff a&m the it did feel for all of us and them in that locker room that they were ascending right that this program was going places and they were and one of the things he pointed out was that you had some veterans in that locker room that had kind of paved the way, and Max learned under them. And he thought that he, along with Layden, I think he mentioned Damani, like they, they were going to set a tone, and they tried. But then, obviously, some of the mismanagement across the street, some of the personalities that came over all kind of spiraled in a direction that it, once it started spiraling, spiraled that direction, uh, there was, it felt like it was not going to get fixed. And it did not. I did not, even though I wanted it to work. I made, were, it, I made excuses that why it would work. Like I said, from what we've been told, uh, that uh, the fact that they had seven wins and were in a position to beat Alabama, in a, position, a real position to beat Alabama, Ole Miss, and uh, whoever the other one was, not LSU, but uh, anyway, that's my, Tennessee. Um, it, it is amazing from what we've heard, that they were in position to win those games and win as many as they did. Brian Foley, Law Hotline. That's where we find our QB1, Stephen McGee. Stephen, good morning, buddy. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. How are you? you ever have that, that moment where you're like, wait, what's happening? Oh, crap. I, I'm late. I'm, I've missed something. Um, I get your text, Nuno, and I'm like, man, it's 825. <laughs> and then I look at my iPhone, and it says it's 840. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm 10 minutes late. Um, and I realize that I had to have my computer reboot the other day in our IT. And when I did, uh, my Dell computer shows 825. And, you know, you can't adjust that. It's like the computer does it, but it's off. It's weird. And so I apologize for being late. You're all good, buddy. All, all good. Hey, uh, I do. I, I think I want to start off with something I read from Mark Richt. And I'd just like you to get your thoughts on this. He says that Max Johnson, uh, the former A&M quarterback now at North Carolina, has the same skill set of Sam Howell, Drake May, and he thinks that North Carolina is going to be killing Ooh. it this year. So I think you were high on, on Max to a point. Just uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it, look, it, obviously there's some bias in that statement. It's got to be because it's his nephew, right? So um, I, I think Max Johnson's a good quarterback. I, I, I've said all along that I think he'll probably play in the NFL. He's a good chance he plays in the NFL for quite some time. I could see him being a really good backup. Um I, you know, yeah, Sam Howell comparison wouldn't bother me as much. Drake May, um, potential number two, number three overall pick in the NFL draft, uh, pretty high upside from a talent perspective. Max Johnson, um, talented, yes. A tick slow on everything he does. Decision-making, I think his feet are a little bit slow. Uh, his release, everything, it just, it all could speed up a little bit for, for me. Um, but again, I could see him going there and having a lot of success and and, and being drafted uh, middle middle round. Uh, that's not a stretch, in my opinion. I think uh, Max Johnson's a good quarterback. I don't think he's as good as uh, May or Howe. I mean, Howe's a starter in the NFL. Yeah. I don't think that uh, that Max will ever be a starter in the NFL, ever. Uh, I would not be surprised if he landed on a roster and was on a roster, you know, get, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a Kellen Mond type NFL career. I'll put it that way. Okay. Steven, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I think that's the, I think that's where the odds are more likely than not. I mean, the Kellen Mond NFL career is the above average NFL career. Let's be honest. Um, there's a lot of quarterbacks that don't even make it that far. Heck make day one rosters hard enough. So, uh, I foresee. I like him. He's smart. Yeah, he he's is a smart quarterback, and, and, and he, he can throw it. He can spin it, and so I think. And he's tall. He's got the frame. I think he's got the kind of skill set that NFL teams will fall in love with. Now, there's obviously a strong trend towards the Lamar Jackson of the world, but those are a few and far between. I could see his career taking him to where you know someday he's got a really long beard and playing in Hamilton, Ontario. <laughs> Bless his heart. I just hope not. <laughs> what about Jim Harbaugh to the Chargers, Stephen? Oh. 
yeah, I mean, it seemed like the writing was on the wall. Uh, it's a great move for him. I mean, he's he's operated out in the West Coast before, obviously, and uh, he he inherits a really really good quarterback. I love Justin Herbert. I think he's one of the one of the great young talents in the NFL. He can make all the throws. I'm excited to see him paired with Jim Harbaugh to see if he can work some of his quarterback magic with a talent like that. Uh, I feel like the Chargers have been one of the biggest disappointments in the NFL for quite some time. They've got um, a lot of ability. They've they got some really good defensive pieces as well, but they have a horrible defense. And, and so uh, it definitely seemed like there was a lack of coaching, if yeah, you will, a doubt. Uh, for the results. I can't remember the guy's name, but he was incompetent. I'm going to say this. The Chargers coaching, the Chargers head coach was worse than Mike McCarthy. The Chargers head coach was worth the most. I can't think of his name, Brendan something, but yeah. um, the uh, uh, Jim Harbaugh, the the Chargers got significantly better. Significantly yesterday. better, no, no doubt about that. Hey, uh, Stephen, spring games coming up, and we'd started having a conversation about win totals because SEC Mike has the win total for A and M at seven. Uh, you may need to glance at the schedule, but uh, do you think that's a fair number considering all the changes and the new regime and whatnot? Yeah, you know, I, I said this probably three, four weeks ago. I uh, felt like it was potentially going to be a rebuild year. And before we signed all of these transfer portal guys, I really believe that. Now, um, yeah, I think seven is very fair. Uh, I think we got to reset our expectations. Year one of a new regime, getting everybody um, converted over to new systems and so, you know, new languages. But there is a bullish case to be had for this football team when you get a lot of veteran talent, number one, like we have, assuming that these guys can play, uh, you have a really good quarterback. You have a coach that has an underdog mentality and that I think is putting in the right types of assistant coaches that can make a difference that we've lacked for four staff now. Uh, I am very bullish on the potential for them to exceed seven wins, especially with a weaker schedule, in my opinion, uh, other than the front end and back end. Yeah, you know, I, I can say I, I agree. I, I would take the over right now. All right, let's hit a break. We're going to come back with more with Stephen McGee here, our QB1 from Paragon Financial. Right now we're talking about the Association of Former Students. If you love the travel, and I certainly do, and you want to see the world, you can do it with a bunch of fellow Aggies. The Traveling Aggies program takes Aggies and their friends on a once-in-a-lifetime adventure around the world with details arranged by trusted travel partners. The Association of Former Students invites you to explore the possibilities at the Traveling Aggies Expo 2025 Showcase, an exclusive event unveiling the 25 Aggie trips out there. The Expo is set for this Friday, January 26, 1.30 to 6 o'clock at the Clayton W. Williams Jr. Alumni Center. This is where you can learn about adventures as each travel partner will host short sessions highlighting their unique destinations. You can also take advantage of a special trip savings at the Expo as well. And you'll have free Messina Hoff wine tasting door prizes, a chance to win the grand prize of an Aggie baseball weekend getaway, which includes two tickets to an A&M baseball game in the association suite, a two-night stay at the A&M Hotel and Conference Center, dinner for two at the Vintage House Restaurant located on Messina Hoff Estate, and a Messina Hoff wine basket. Online registration is closed, but you can still attend with the walk-up registration at the Alumni Center. It is the Association of Former Students.
We're back, Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations, OB, myself, and Stephen McGee on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Let's play a little buy, sell, lease. NFL draft QBs, all right? Stephen, I'm going to give you the three top names out there. You kind of tell me who you would buy, sell, lease for a great NFL career. Uh, Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels. Gosh, this is a tough one this year. <laughs> Those are all three really good ones. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to uh, – I'm going to buy Caleb Williams, and I have some skepticism about him. Too many turnovers, um, in my opinion, for how many starts he has underneath that same Lincoln Riley system at USC against some lesser caliber, def- lesser caliber defenses at, in the pack. Uh, 12. I, man, I'll go with him first, though, because of a high ceiling. He's got unbelievable talent. Uh, Jaden Daniels, two. Drake May, three. Um, Daniels is intriguing to me. Uh, arguably the best year out of all of them, obviously. Wins the Heisman. Uh, has really resurrected his career at LSU. He's a phenomenal player. And I think the most that closely mirrors Lamar Jackson and I say that because the NFL is a copycat league. They get something hot. And right now, who's the hot team in the NFL? The Ravens and Lamar Jackson. And so I think a team could be highly intrigued by a quarterback uh, like Jaden Daniels who can run, uh, may run a 4-4 at the combine, and who can make all the throws. OB? Um, I'm going to buy Drake May. I'm going to lease Caleb Williams for okay. a lot of the reasons that that uh, Stevens mentioned. You know, I go back to he's always had better talent around him than he's pl- facing. Sure. And yeah, he can make throws, but there, there's some. There's I, I think he's overhyped. I think he's. Gonna, I could see him being a Jameis Winston. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna sell um, Jaden Daniels because I get the comparison. To Lamar Jackson, but I don't think he's Lamar Jackson. I don't know that his game is going to translate to the NFL as well as Lamar Jackson. My thing with Caleb, and I know we had John Elway do it and Eli Manning do it and others have done it, but I don't like when you start like negotiating with teams and through the media of like, if you take me number one, I may not go, you know, like that kind of stuff that he does and her dad did and there was that GQ <clears throat> interview. Yeah, the, I, want, I, I don't I want ownership. Yeah, I, I, I'm out with drama, completely out. Just I want nothing to do with drama. I just look at when he was – everybody was talking about him when he was uh, at o, OU, and they damn near lost to Kansas. In fact, if he hadn't pulled the ball away from a running back, they probably do, who was getting stopped on fourth down. You go to USC, and you know, you're playing those lame Pac-12 defenses, and so, of course, you're supposed to look good. But when they played a good defense against Notre Dame, he looked awful. Yeah. So that's – I agree. That's I, I will I, say this about Daniels in his defense. Of the three, you'd have to say his greatest strength is his deep ball. Man, how many great deep balls does this guy throw? I mean, yeah. on the money, dropped it in the bucket. Yeah, but how uh, much of the NFL do they depend on the uh, medium and out routes? Yeah, I mean, obviously, OB, you're, you're correct. I mean, the, the, the bread and butter is the ability to – anticipate throws in those interior windows. And this is what Connor Wigman is so great about and why I'm so high on him. The ability to anticipate those tight window throws before a guy comes out of the break and be very, very accurate. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, that's not what LSU did. But on deep balls, when you're getting man-to-man, you got to make the throw under pressure. That guy did it. Steven, thank you very much. Appreciate you. All right, see you guys. Have a good weekend. OB, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. When we come back on Tech Radio, Jim Schlossnagel in studio. I saw him out there. He's here. We'll chat with him next.
All right, let's not waste any time. Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Jim Schlossnagel in studio. Hello, sir. Howdy. Good morning. Howdy. So first off, thank you. The upgrade to the studio <laughs> is fantastic. We've got the the cleats. We got the hell. It's awesome. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. We got it. We had to update some things uh, here from the baseball perspective. <laughs> it had been a minute. All right, so we're <clears throat> we're less than a month out from opening weekend. Just um, I I know we've talked about it at, at the break. You haven't been able really to feel very much because of the weather. How are you feeling about things considering all the, uh, the drama with the weather recently? Yeah, I mean, I think we've made the most of our opportunities. Um, we've been able to get inside and move around a few times, batting cages. Uh, we're, I mean, I think baseball coaches are as good as anybody, especially if you're from you know, the northern part of the country where, I, where I'm from. I've, I've had to put together pr- plenty of practices in gyms. And, <laughs> and for the most part, as we know, College baseball is, even in this part of the country, is a cold weather sport. Yeah. Uh, until you hit, it's either really, really cold or chilly at night or incredibly hot. Uh, hopefully, we're playing home in June and it's really hot. But uh, so baseball coaches are used to that. Um, but you never really, you can't figure out your team in a bullpen or in a batting cage. Like you have to play the games. So I think today we should be able to get out there and then this weekend play those inter squad games where you get to figure out who can, you know, who can do what. Uh, who has changed over the course of the Christmas break um, and just and mainly figure out the pitching and, and get it lined up and, and at the same time keep everybody healthy. Does it feel like you're number three? Uh, Cause it, you know that, what I'm saying? That's, like a really you- good, that's a really good question. Um, in some ways, I still feel somewhat new, mm-hmm. uh, but at the same time, I think I have a pretty good grasp of, of Texas A&M and Aggieland and Bryan College Station. Uh, just bought some land out west of town all right so yeah uh so yeah year three sounds about right yeah it it, to me if it's gone by like that and then like your season ends and people cannot wait for the next season to start it'd been a minute so and here we are with it about to start with some new faces out there have you guys figured out a uh, a plan for Braden on on pitching and for his outfield play well he's certainly gonna play the outfield uh he's certainly gonna be in the lineup you know, you have to think, barring injury, he'll be in the lineup almost every day. Uh, from a pitching staff standpoint, you know, how much anybody pitches, including Braden, will be relative to how good he pitches relative to everybody else. If he's one of the best pitchers, he'll pitch. I mean, if he's not, he, he won't as much. Uh, but I, he's his, uh, just watching him in his bullpens, uh, we've had one uh, what we call simulated game where we did get on the field without a live defense. It was just pitcher versus hitter. They call those sim games, and the overall quality of his stuff is much better. Max has done a great job giving him some serviceable pitches. Uh, he's actually, you know, he has a really good feel for his off-speed pitches uh, as much as his fastball. So if that's why we have to go play these inter-squad games yeah. and give him an opportunity to compete and, uh, and go win a job right there with everybody else. Have you evolved with the way you look at the portal? Because, I mean, you used it year one, and... Um... I think you, you still want to build with, with the youth coming up, the high school ranks. That being said, uh, mindsets have changed all in college athletics. Yeah, you know, I think in, in, in our sport, I had this conversation with our team actually the other day. People talk about the transfer portal too much. Uh, most of my career, you've had open ch- transferring in baseball. It's just been about the last 10 or 12 years where they treated us like football used to be treated and you had to sit out. So you've had actually open transferring most of my career, it just wasn't on a waiver wire. It wasn't on a website where you could just go look it up. It wasn't on Twitter. Um, what has changed baseball in, in college baseball is a 20 round draft. Mm. And there's now about 40 or 50 less minor league teams. So you have this funnel of all the baseball players out there in the United States, high school, whatever, and they're trying to make it to the big leagues. Well, now there's only, there's so few jobs in professional baseball. Um, so there's more good players coming to college. There's more good players staying in college. Yes, they can bounce around. Um, but I believe this is the golden age of college baseball. College baseball, is, even, fi- even pre-COVID, college baseball is not even close to being as good as it is today. And so uh, that's where the real challenge is. The portal, I mean, I think most Aggie fans out there, at the end of the day, they want us to have a great team every year. They want us to have a chance to win every year. And so what we'll try to do, uh, what we are trying to do, is we're trying to mesh that like every other sport is. Um, 
And I think the more we can, the more recruiting classes we can put on top of each other, like we did this past one, uh, and then you know we can not rely. It's not rely on the portal, but it's not. It, we're gonna ch- we want to cherry pick the portal. We don't want to you know build a team o- around it unless you have to. But the draft is so late, and I think you and I have talked about this mm-hmm. before. Until in high, until a high school player, think about it. The portal be, opens up in May, right? And until a high school player, if we have a high school player, if X high school player that we've signed pulls his name out of the draft, he says, "Yeah, coach, I'm just taking my name out of the draft. I will be at school next year." Okay, then we won't sign a player, a transfer at your position. But if you can't do, if you can't tell me that, what the heck you want me to do? Right. My job's to take the best player. Or and if you can't tell me you're coming, then yeah, we have to go get one because we have to have a shortstop or a left-handed pitcher, whatever it is. So, so it's it's just going to vary year to year. Jace, a lot of expectations for him. Where do you see him statistically taking his game? Um, good question. Number one, defensively, if he's if he's going to play center field, which as of today he would, um, you know that's going to be a, a it's not a new thing for him because he played there in high school, but that's you know that's a different challenge than than he had last year. Um, I don't think when you're as big and strong and fast as he is, even in your freshman year, I don't think you're sneaking up on anybody. Yeah. And he was hitting in the middle of our lineup all last year. So I think Jace is a very confident player. He works hard. Um, you know, the baseball gods can certainly get anybody at any time, and you can have a rough season. Uh, but uh, I think Jace is just going to have to continue baseball-wise. He's got to ha- uh, manage the strike zone. And if and the same thing with Braden. Braden went from 18 walks his freshman year at Stanford to 51 walks, and no good hitter goes to home plate, and no good hitter I want to coach goes to home plate hoping they walk. A walk is the result of you being patient, patiently aggressive on your pitch, and so um, you got to pitch to somebody in this lineup. And if you're willing to, including Jace, if you're willing to spit on those pitches and pass the baton to the next guy. That's where a, that's where an offense really has a chance to be great. So, um, so I, to answer your question, I would say continue to manage the strike zone because we know if he puts his swing on his pitch more often than not, should be a pretty good result. I'm sure on your whiteboard or in your brain, you've toyed with leadoff options. <coughs> Can you kind of shed some light on that? Yeah, every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, outside of um, I've learned how to feed horses. Uh, uh, yeah, that, it's lineups. Um, yeah, I mean, just, it just depends on who wins what job. And a leadoff hitter, people, you know, the old school leadoff hitter was the the small, fast guy that drew walks and stolen bases. And in, in a good lineup, in a really good lineup, one through nine, you want those eight and nine hole hitters to be guys that are good hitters too. Uh, but you also want to at least make sure they can get on base. That means your leadoff hitter needs to be a good hitter because he's coming up with the exception of the first inning. He's coming up with runners on base. Hunter Haas was an awesome leadoff hitter. Mm-hmm. Why? I mean, he didn't steal a ton of bases, but he got he got on base at a decent rate, but he could really hit. Yeah. And he went in the fourth or fifth round and got paid close to half a million dollars because of it. So um, so what goes into that will be, you know, what kind of hitter is the guy? You know, if the guy draws walks and he can run, but he can't hit, then that's not a great leadoff hitter because he's going to lose RBI opportunities. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's... I mean, we could bounce around names, but I don't even want to do that because I don't, nobody's really won a job yet. Uh, you know, that's why we got to get these inter squad games going. Well, I was going to say that's how some of these decisions will come down to is what happens in these preseason scrimmages, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's not the end all because you're certainly going to give a veteran player who's shown you the capability uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt. Like, I would have to think Jace is going to win a job, right? I would have to think Braden's going to win a job. Um, And then you're going to also, as a coach, you're going to look at, you know, what is the overall upside of the player? Uh, For instance, Gavin Grahovic, like he's a young player. He's very talented, super talented player, works hard, selfless, has all those great uh, attributes. Um, Where does, where is he best fit in, uh, in the infield? And where does he, if he plays, where does he best fit in the lineup? So, but yeah, you can certainly have guys. uh, I, I always believe that I've, I've never written a lineup. The, the players write the lineup by how they play, how they perform, how they practice, what kind of people they are. Can you trust them? Uh, so all those things. So that's why we, we just have to get through the next three weeks. Um, I have some ideas, but 
when we uh, we play our first game, you know, it'll be out there. But it's it's never the lineup in the last game of the season re- rarely resembles the lineup in the first game. So you got to play the whole season. You're afforded to have some patience too with young players, right? Because of the core that you bring back. Yeah, I have the patience. Do they have the patience? Mm-hmm. That's the thing, you know. Do they have the patience to sit and say, you know, I'm not in the lineup first day. You know, when we play these inter squad games, everybody gets to play. We don't have open substitution like Coach Elko and Buzz where you can cherry pick times to right. put this guy in and take him out. In, in baseball, when you put a guy in, a guy has to come out and he doesn't get to go back in. And so that's, and you only play four games a week and they all count. And people you know, sometimes say, well, what are you going to do in the midweek games? Well, the, all the midweek games count. We went back and looked at some of the most successful seasons at Texas A&M or really any school. And, uh, you know, when I was at TCU or, or here, like, man, you, those, you're like 20 and five or some crazy 18 and five or whatever it is in your midweek games or your non-conference games. And that's how you put together a great season. And, and, and you don't do that without playing your best players most of the time. To stay on that um, freshman arms, do you feel good about where they are? I, I, I do. Uh, we're just really trying to manage their workload. It's so much. It's so much. But Brendan, Brendan Tolick has taken a big jump for me. Um, I trust him to this point. Ha- haven't seen him pitch in a real game yet. Uh, Isaac Morton is incredibly talented. Um, Caden Wilson is incredibly talented. Weston Moss, who was out most of the fall, just very under, he's underweight, under not very strong, uh, which can lead to injury. So we've tried to build him up in that. He's shown some signs of maybe being able to pitch here uh, this year at some point. I'm sure there's somebody I'm missing, but but those guys are, are really talented. It would just be awesome if the older pitchers who have been around a little bit, we don't have that much SEC experience, but just the age-wise pitchers, the Tanner Joneses of the world, along with Zane Badmiev, the, those are new guys, Justin Lampkin, Sadeo, Cortez. Mm-hmm. If those guys could you know, really help carry the load on the front end of the season so we could cherry-pick innings to get these guys, you know, get their feet wet before SEC play, you know, that would be the most ideal thing. But... Hopefully, you know, injuries usually play a role in that. Hopefully we won't have any, but that rare, rarely do you go through a season, you know, without something to deal with. Prager doing all right? Oh, yeah, Prager. Great, great. That's another. Yeah, Prager's really throwing well. Uh, yeah. He's he's uh, he's thriving with uh, Max uh, in, in the bullpen. Learned some new pitches. Um, really excited about the direction he's headed. And Bad, Bad Mayoff, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Bad Mayoff was a guy who was out. Uh, he's, you know, he pitched against us last year at Tarleton. I think he's in his fifth or sixth year of college. He's a strike thrower, which those, those guys at least give you a chance, like Evan Oshenbeck. Um, he's trying to build back up his arm strength, velocity, stuff like that. He can really spin a breaking ball and throw it for strikes, so he's certainly going to have a role. Talk to us a little bit about Jackson Appel. Uh, yeah. Excitement level for him. Yeah, neat guy. Uh, neat guy. Uh, Penn graduate. Um, Obviously, you know, super smart guy, intellectual on a field. Uh, he had a, he's been playing for three years with bone chips in his elbow and just played through it. And we convinced him, that, why don't we just fix it? You know, you never know how much better you might be. And he had that surgery in December. Uh, it's helped him get stronger in the weight room. Uh, so he's a you know, switch hitter. Uh, he's got a he's really good, accurate thrower. He's not a very big guy, but he's not, but he's not weak. And so... Uh, with him and Max back there, along with Hank Bard and, and Grohovic's actually a pretty good catcher. Yeah. Um, so, so in an emergency situation, we could have that. But I think Jackson's going to play a lot. <clears throat> and if Montgomery, Targot, and uh, Targot and, and Appel are all in the same lineup, I don't think I've ever had a lineup with three switch hitters in it. So that'll give you a little bit of, of, of lineup balance. How can Evan uh, Oshenbeck build on what he did last year? I think uh, I think Max has made a few changes with him to help him even be more effective. <clears throat> he's not a power power stuff guy. He's not gonna. He, now he ran a fastball by Dylan Cruz in the conference tournament at ninety three miles an hour. Right. So, you know, he's one of those guys whose performance in the games is his stuff is usually higher than what it is in a bullpen. But his presence, his he's so dependable, right? And and at the end of the day, like anything else in life. Um, you're going to go with the person you trust the most. Right. I, I trust them. I know how many times last year did I, I feel so bad sometimes. A pitcher on the game, he goes, to, he just walked a guy, he's at 2-0 count, 
I changed the guy, I changed the pitcher in the middle of the count and bring in Evan Oshin back and I'll say, Hey man, sorry, buddy, pick me up. And he can always do it. Yeah. Uh, so he, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's really good off speed pitches and mixes his pitches and throws strikes. He's a real pitcher. Now that Max has been here for a few months, Wiener, just uh, talk about that relationship and seeing him because you had read so much and talked to him in the interview process, but now having him here. Yeah, very unique guy and a uh, special, special person, first of all. Uh, very, very hard worker. Uh, incredibly, incredibly excited to be in college baseball mm -hmm. for someone who has only ever been in college baseball as a player and went immediately into professional baseball out of college. He is infinitely intelligent. Uh, understands all of the new age stuff, but is incredibly simplistic in presenting to the player what they need to know. Uh, he's very, very good at eliminating what I would call things that aren't relevant mm -hmm. uh, and making sure the pitcher just basically, you know, throw every single pitch, throw has a shape and a location and a speed and throw it to the middle of the plate. Uh, because it's most likely not going to end up in the middle. And his use of analytics and the statistics, uh, he only uses a, just a little bit what the player needs to know. But some of those, some of those things are, you know, when, when you just throw a strike, for example, just a strike on the first, if the fir first pitch of the at-bat, doesn't matter the pitch, doesn't matter the location, anything, just in the strike zone in the SEC, 94% of the time, you get it, the ball back in your glove as a strike, if the umpire calls it, and it's a strike, or an out. Now think about that. Like, just throw it over the freaking plate, right. right? Just give us a chance. And if you're doing that with some decent stuff, then it's, you know, then, you know, you, you can build on that. But just little things like that, that sometimes pitchers, you know, their young pitchers are afraid of contact. They're afraid to throw the ball in the strike zone because, you know, they're not used to getting hit. Um, and I don't, I, I'll never get upset if a guy fills the strike zone up and he gets hit around. That just means he's having a bad day or the other team's good, uh, which most of the teams we play are. But most of the time, you know, you give up free bases, you're going to lose the game. Would you say you're more of a hybrid um, in that old school baseball? Yes. But you will look at the analytics. You will look at the new wave of baseball. You kind of eyeball slash analytic kind of leader. I'd like to think so. I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I don't have all the answers and. I would sure hope that I'm going to be a better coach tomorrow than I was today, and I hope I'm a better coach today than I was yesterday. So I, I, I want to learn. We have these young people in our office that I'm like, holy cow, how does that even cross your mind? Uh, and, they'll, and I'll say, man, teach me that. Like, tell me, tell me where, what, what does that mean? And then I process that information. And then when we get to the games, you know, then we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a plan going in. And then from that point forward, it's going to be, the instincts of, of the player, who do I trust? Um, try to put the guys in the best situation to have success, uh, which is, you know, that's another topic sometime we can talk about is, you know, does a coach's decision have to work to mean it was the right decision? Mm. I've always wanted to ask OB that, actually. That's a great question, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if we have time, but yeah, come on. Yeah, so, so in 2000, so I'm coaching at TCU and uh, we're getting ready to play. Buck Showalter was the manager of the Rangers at the yeah. time. And all my time at TCU, I had uh, I, I got to know all those managers, Ron Washington, Jeff Bannister, all those guys really well, really well. And Buck was, uh, he was kind of a hero, not hero, but he was, a, I, I admired him. And so uh, we, we're getting ready to play the University of Utah one weekend, and they had a hitter named C.J. Crone, went in the first round, has played in the major leagues for over 10 years, big power hitter. And we decided on the weekend, under no circumstances, is C.J. Crone going to beat us? I mean, like, under no circumstances? Yeah, yeah, under no circumstance. So, of course, it gets to game three of the series, two outs, bottom and ninth. We're up four runs. The bases are loaded, and Crone's up. Uh -oh. <clears throat> I intentionally walked him with the bases loaded. The next guy had actually hit two home runs that weekend, so it wasn't just an easy hitter. And he hit a ground ball to shortstop. We fielded it through the out first base. Game over. We win. And I just couldn't wait to call Buck because he had intentionally walked Barry Bonds with the bases loaded. And I said, I just can't wait to tell Buck. I, right, did, right. I, you know, I did what he did. And I called him and I said, hey, man, um, I want to let you know what happened today. And I told him and I said, yeah, it worked out. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said to me, he said, hey, just because it worked out doesn't mean it, it wouldn't have been the right decision. And so that's what, you know, coaching to me, 
I coached at UNLV for a couple years. I've, I've never gambled, but if you go into a blackjack room or a card table room, if you knew that card table, you had a 40% chance to win. And that card table, you had an 80% chance to win. Which one would you play? Go to the 80. You go to the 80. But you got a 20% chance of it not working out. Correct. So really, in reality, outs, you know, the game management of the game, I'm not talking about coaching, like teaching a guy how to throw a curveball, all the stuff you do in practice. I'm talking the managing of the game is just – all right, what gives us the best chance, chance in this spot, right? Is it putting down a bunt? Is it bringing this pitcher yeah. in? Is it bringing uh, Palish in in a 3-2 count in a Super Regional, right? You know, and, the, and so anyway, that's where I think sometimes fan, and I'm a fan too of a lot of things, but coaching, when you make, just because a guy made a decision to start this player or call this play, does, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't mean it was the right decision. It just they, that coach at that time thought it was the best chance. So trying, I'm not trying to preach, but that's just really none of this stuff is guaranteed, man. You just, you're trying to give your team the best chance and then go from there. I love that story. Uh, I'm sure that'll be on the rewind. Final thing, you mentioned feeding horses. You're learning. Tell me a little bit. Of, is this like something you've always thought about? Like <laughs> how did the whole ranch no. thing and all this come Yeah, together? no, my, uh, yeah, I've been dating the same girl for three years and she's a big horse person, Alyssa. Anybody who's been around me during my time at Texas A&M mm-hmm. has met Alyssa and, uh, and we're trying to get her down here from Fort Worth and, and, and she, uh, she doesn't come with children. She comes with horses and ranch dogs. So I uh, bought a place out west of town, about 70 acres and yeah. re, uh, remodeling a home and, and uh, got a few tractors and had to go home in the, in the pouring rain yesterday. Those horses got to eat. So, right. uh, so yeah, um, it's, it was not the most glamorous thing, but it is, uh, it's, it, it's, it, ha- it has a peaceful side to it, to be with those animals and, and they're, they're her horses. So I got to make sure I don't kill them. So I got to feed them. As I get closer to 50, one of the things I I'm learning about myself is I want to learn things that I wasn't comfortable doing before or wanting to do it. It, sure. it, it is a, it's a fun journey when you keep adding to your plate. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Just to be a constantly evolve and, and, uh, especially, especially, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm 53 years old. I don't, I'm not, I'm not the guy that goes home and sits and watches Netflix. You know, I want, I want something to do. And, and whether it used to be, I've, I've had a lake house in Fort Worth. Now I have this little farm out in Snook. Uh, I went to my first Snook Blue Jay basketball game the other cool. night. It was, it was, it was legit. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm enjoying my time here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Caller number one right now, we're going to give you a free car wash from Aggieland Express Car Wash in South College Station off of William D. Fitch in Greens Prairie. They are Aggie owned and operated with a friendly staff and a personal touch. They offer a monthly membership, but we'll give the first caller a free car wash right now from Aggieland Express in South College Station, 979-693-1150.
We're back. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. How about that interview with Schloss? It was awesome. Uh, appreciate uh, Jim coming by, telling us about the ranch. Uh, that story with Buck Showalter was phenomenal. Love that. And it's true in, in life for all of us. Sometimes you make the right decision, uh, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it does not. Um, all right, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Callie's got us a little update on around the SEC. What do you have for us? Yeah, we'll start right here in Aggieland. Um, a former A&M defensive line coach, Terrell Williams, was selected to coach the American team in the Senior Bowl. Um, he coached at A&M for two years under Mike Sherman, and he coached Tony Gerard Eddy, who is our current defensive line coach. Yeah, and you uh, you mentioned that. I'm looking at some of his uh, resume uh, coach with the Raiders, coach with the Dolphins, coach with the Titans, obviously, the, the two years at Texas A&M. So that's cool to see. Really neat. The, la- the game last night against uh, for Alabama and Auburn was the— What a game. Oh, such a game. It was so awesome that there's no longer um, an undefeated team in the SEC, which is really neat. Uh, kind of chaos created, but really, really fun. There was some— intense moments with the lights and things I saw going that, on yeah. and, and people got upset i think people got upset because Jalen milrow was being interviewed at a basketball game yeah. like i saw that on social like let let them talk what are you talking about what's the problem there there were definitely some uh comments about football at the basketball game a lot of people were not not happy but that's to be expected with that rivalry there along with alabama ryan williams committed back to alabama after he decommitted um, when saban retired he took a few visits around SEC schools, including A&M, after he decommitted. But he announced on Twitter that he didn't really leave, but he's back. So we're excited to see him thrive at Alabama, potentially. Uh, Arkansas is now 1-4 and four in conference play, with their one win being a one-point game with the winning shot scored less than two seconds to play. We're not going to talk about who that game was against. Yeah, don't do that. But that is the news with Arkansas. They host college game day in Kentucky on Saturday both teams are coming off of 15 plus point losses so that should be an interesting game Arkansas is off to a one and five start in conference play which is the exact same start as last year and last year they reached the sweet 16 with their loss to UConn who was the future tournament champion so maybe they can turn things around Missouri is 0 and 6 in conference and that is their worst conference start since 2017 and they went two and 16 in conference that year so that, that's surprising because they got some talent on that team uh it's been a surprising start to their sec play and oh by the way i believe if i'm remembering correctly arkansas still only has one win so um good times or really bad times really bad times. anything else We've got a text going back to the over-under for A&M wins. Matt in San Antonio says he would easily take over seven wins because he doesn't see how you could not get at least one win better than last year with Wigman. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that and goes. and Elko. And Elko and all the, all the interesting staff and exciting staff that we've got created down here in Aggieland. So we're excited to see. I would, I would take the over, too. I think... I think, you know, we've got awesome, awesome transfers, awesome commits from high school, a great coaching staff. I think we have a lot of potential. We've got a really favorable schedule coming into 2024 with the 12 team playoff. I think there's a lot of exciting things that could happen with the Aggie football team. So Callie, great job. Hey, Nick Savage, I think you had an update for us as well. Yeah, I have a quick little note. I uh, was perusing Twitter and uh, an uh, little MLB note, Houston Astros just signed uh I want to get make sure I get the name right here as I pull the tweet up my fault Mitchell Kilkenny pitched at A&M just recently I believe his last year was 2017 uh he's bounced around a few uh, major league uh clubs but he just got picked up by the Astros so hopefully we see him him in uh in Houston here this coming season gig him buddy all right good stuff thank you very much Nick when we come back Aaron Torres of Aaron Torres online he'll probably be on a highway there's no doubt he'll be on the highway right Nick like, that's a fact. He yeah, walks be, in the middle of a freeway. I don't know if it's that or, like, walking, like, playing chicken with a train. I think he likes to do that, He too. loves trains. He loves walking in the middle of the five, like they say there in Los Angeles. So we'll talk to our buddy Aaron Torres uh, when we come back. Right now, a moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet. They are on Highway 21 in Caldwell and online at caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. they got great deals on their website. They change them month to month. If you've purchased a vehicle there from Caldwell Country Chevrolet, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I did. 
I did it June of last year. I know the di- the date because it was the slowest process for me. For them, it was, you know, they were, like, they were very patient with me. It was my fault because, like, in, like, January and February, I was like, yeah, I think we're going to need a new car. And then, you know, you just keep driving it. And then we went to uh, Sefchecks, and, and they, they looked at it. They're like, Nuno, this, this is a death trap. You need a new car. I was like, okay. So finally called Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Went like that, right? They, they showed me the, uh, the Tahoe that we ended up buying. We, we bought that bad boy. The service was amazing. We got a great trade-in. Uh, it was just the whole experience was phenomenal, and we really appreciate the good work there. And by the way, it's only a 15-minute drive. You know, we're talking in the edge of Brian to the beginnings of Caldwell, short conversation away. But you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 and Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. Welcome back in to the program. We call it Tech Sacks Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio, and it is now time to go around college athletics with our friends at Millican Reserve, a college station community featuring homes, trails, farms, and wide open spaces. And they have a, mil- a mission to build a healthy community around nature. Take part in the Millican Reserve community with a conservancy membership. Learn more at millicanreserve.com. Let's go to the hotline, the Brian Foley hotline. That's where we find Aaron Torres of Fox Sports Radio and Aaron Torres Online. AT, ¿cómo estás, señor? I'm okay. I heard you were making fun of me in the previous break. That's yeah, all. I, I did. Yeah, that, that, that was the whispers that were coming around. Yeah. I, I, I listen did. to the tech tech. You think I'm just a, a guest? No, I listen. Well, I but, got eyes and ears everywhere. Buddy, I, if I kid with you, it's because I like you. 
Okay. Uh, well, you must really like me then, based on on the rumors that are, are circulating around the internet right now. All I said Everybody was said you were really going. All I yeah, said I was you like. Hard. Oh my, the delay is killing me. I'll let you start. My line. <laughs> and scene. Let's talk to uh, Jim Harbaugh to the Chargers, man. But to your neck of the woods over there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, listen, uh, I don't think it's surprising from the college football perspective, dude. It is sad. Like, I was thinking about this is, you know, there's so few people that are, like, truly, I mean, I guess he's polarizing. I don't, I, I mean, I guess I know why, because I was thinking back to the early days of his tenure when he did the satellite camps and all that. But there's not that many people that people are genuinely interested in. And I think he did bring an interest level to Michigan that simply will not be there once he leaves. You know, I was thinking about this is, you know, how many times, like, Fox Big News kickoff, like, didn't have a marquee game. And they're just like, oh, Michigan-Illinois is our marquee game this week or Michigan-Indiana or whatever. And it just spoke to, to the presence that he had now. From the NFL perspective, I'm excited because I do live in L.A. I have no real allegiance to the Chargers in any way, but I do like seeing, you know, talented people put in positions to succeed. And obviously, Justin Herbert will now have, I think, maybe the first real coach he's had in his entire career if you want to include Mario Cristobal at Oregon, depending on how you feel about him. So I'm excited about that. Sad for college football, but ultimately not surprised. I don't think it was the NCAA stuff. I think, listen, you win a championship, J.J. McCarthy leaves. I think they had like 44 seniors on this roster. So it, it felt like everything was building towards this year. By the way, hate to brag, that's why I picked them to win a national championship in the preseason, which they did. You accomplished everything you said you did. Now it's time to accomplish the one thing you haven't yet, which is win a Super Bowl as a coach. Uh, and those are kind of my big picture takeaways on, on Jim Harbaugh now being the target head coach. So... Sean Moore is going to get the gig, you think? Or do they maybe try to go for a big fish? BK is a name. Brian Kelly is a name that Billy floated months back if this were going to potentially happen. I'm not seeing his name as often mentioned. So who is it? Who do you yeah. think it might be? Well, it sh I just think, and listen, this isn't a very unique take. Everyone said it, but I think everybody's right in this case. Just seeing the attrition at Alabama when Nick Saban left, um, and, you know, it's a little bit overblown, but, you know, talented players left that program, I think about 10 or so after the Kalen DeFour takeover. Um, I think you just have to just promote internally. And I, I do think you'll be able to keep most of the roster together. And I don't think that super obvious guy is out there, right? I mean, yeah, Brian Kelly, whatever. It's Brian Kelly 62 years old. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think Sharon Moore is the right guy. Prove that he could win. Now it'll be interesting. He was the primary play caller. Does he delegate those duties to somebody else? But I do think sometimes I think you know, kind of keeping trying to keep the band together isn't always the right decision. But I do think in this, in this case it is because if you don't, as we just saw at Alabama and as we've seen pretty much everywhere, Texas A and M went through this. You know, everybody goes through it. Is guys are going to leave and guys are still going to leave. But I think the volume is going to be much higher if you bring in somebody from the outside and especially if you let it drag on. And I would think knowing that this was coming, Ward Manuel has been asked about this literally at least since the Rose Bowl. I was at a press conference where he was asked about it. Um, I would think that he's going to move pretty quickly. And, and my guess is that yes, it ends up being Sharon Moore, the offensive coordinator. What do you think about Kellen DeBoer, uh, his staff? I know there's a lot of turmoil there from guys leaving, but uh, they'll get some dudes back, uh, in my opinion. They, they certainly will. What do you think about that staff he put together, though? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think a lot of it is largely a little bit overblown. Um, it, it, it sounds like, based on everything, that Caden Proctor, the offensive tackle, was going to leave one way or the other. Um, so it was really Caleb Downs and Julian saying, and even Julian saying, I'm talking about the players leaving, obviously Julian saying only left after Caleb DeBoer brought in one of his quarterbacks. So you're really talking about Caleb Downs. It's really the only marquee guy that was like a total surprise. And so I, I thought it was interesting. I know you asked about the staff, but just in general, the board was on with Pat McAfee yesterday. I listened to most of the interview and he basically said like, I know people think this was bad, and there was definitely a couple of days where it was a little chaotic, but at the end of the day, we lost like eight guys, you know, that, that we obviously would have liked to have back, but 
they have to do what's best for them. And I, and I think when you start thinking about who's actually going to be in that program, most of the core of an SEC champion is returning. Now, it's on him to get the most out of Jalen Milrow. Um, but like I said, the core of an SEC champion is returning. On top of that, you know, he's bringing in four or five difference makers from Washington. It, it, it's impossible to say Alabama's not going to miss a beat because they obviously are. The schedule also next year is very tough for them. I know everybody's schedule is tough in the SEC. But I, I, I think all things considered, once there was obviously no real replacement for saving at Bama, you're going to go outside the family. You get the right guy. And I think he's, for the most part, done about what he uh, done about as well as he could. And, yes, that includes the coaching staff that you asked about, and I never really was talking. <laughs> How surprised are you? Or let me phrase it like this. Are you surprised when a team keeps knocking on the door of potential greatness and then doesn't make a change with a new year, a new problem? And I'm talking about the Buffalo Bills and the Dallas Cowboys when I say it like that. Yeah, so, and, and I was thinking about this this morning. This is why I am excited about Harbaugh going to the Chargers is because I have no real allegiance. Like, I, you know, we cover sports, whatever. So all I want is for a school, a program, a team, an organization to reach its potential. And I think, you know, I didn't get to do my Mike McCarthy rant last week, but, like, that's what frustrates me with the Dallas Cowboys. We have a three-year track record. He wins a bunch of games in the regular season. Doesn't matter, and doesn't win when it matters in the playoffs. And there are so many guys out there that are, are that were or are clear upgrades over him. And he decided to run it back. It's the same with the Buffalo Bills. It's like, dude, you know, I watched that game like 50 other million people on last Sunday. It's like, how many times do you have to lose to Patrick Mahomes and keep running it back before you realize that you got to shake things up? And so. You, you look at the Buffalo Bills, you look at the Dallas Cowboys, it's just disappointing. It's why the Chargers are exciting. And I do think it's kind of an interesting dichotomy in the NFL as opposed to college football, where the argument in college football is we don't give guys enough time. I would argue in general, you kind of know by about year two, year three, if he's the right guy or not. I don't think either of those guys is going to get those two teams over the hump. So it's an interesting scenario. But yes, I, I think you're, you're hitting on something here, David that as a fan, a, a consumer of sports I'm just frustrated with, is I want, to see the, I want to see the Buffalo Bills get over the mountaintop. I want to see the Cowboys reach their potential. And I just think running it back with the same crew three, four, five, six years in a row, I just don't think it's the right decision in either case. Aggie basketball, interesting team in the fact that they can beat anybody, but we've seen their shooting woes cause them some games out there. Are you starting to feel that they've, figured it out at least for maintaining that kind of spot where they are in the SEC? I think so. I think so. Um, I thought that win the other night was, was pretty important um, against LSU because that's a team that, that's beating you. Um, you know, you can't lose to that kind of team twice, twice in a row early in SEC play. So I do think they're starting to figure it out. I think, listen, they're, they're going to be a, a team led by those two guards that were obviously – have been so good for years and, and, and also good. And they're starting to figure it out. I mean, I, I don't have all the metrics and stats in front of me, but obviously I know it was a tough couple of games for Wade Taylor in the lead up to that Kentucky game. He obviously was great. Uh, Boots Rafford was great. And now it's just about maintaining that. The one thing I'll say, I don't think there's very much difference between pretty much anybody in the SEC. Maybe you could argue Tennessee uh, at the top, and certainly you could argue Vanderbilt at the bottom. But the point I'm trying to make, I don't think anybody is really unbeatable. So now it's just going out there and getting those wins. And uh, I don't, you know, I'll be honest, David, I'm, I'd be lying if I said I knew what the schedule looked like going forward. But like I said, you take out, you know, Tennessee probably at the top. There aren't a lot of teams that you sit there and say we're going to really struggle against them, especially knowing that you already have a win over Kentucky, which is probably at worst the second best team in this league, maybe third. So. I just bring it up to say the run is there to go on. You have the veteran guys. Uh, this has been a team that seems to find its groove in, in, in early to mid-January the last two years, and there's no reason they can't do it for a third straight year, especially in this league. Talking to Aaron Torres from Aaron Torres Online here on Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. How about that win from Alabama last night, buddy? It was, it was a weird game. I mean, they were up. They were dominating the first half, and then, you know, you're kind of flipping channels trying to see what else was going on, and all of a sudden it's like a two-point game, and they never, I don't believe, ever lost the lead, but they never really, um, you know, they never really felt super comfortable either. Listen, 
Alabama's a good team. I, I don't think they're elite this year. Auburn is really interesting because they have a great win-loss record, but even Bruce Pearl's kind of been on the record with the media like, I don't really know how good this team is right now. We have our toughest games ahead. So it was an interesting result. But listen, I think that speaks to the SEC, right? Alabama's coming off a bad loss. Tennessee, NATO's kind of questions their toughness or this or that. And I bring it up because they go out getting win. Auburn was undefeated in league play coming in. They take the loss. So, again, I think it does kind of speak to I don't think there's that team in this league outside of, again, maybe Tennessee that you look at and you say, you know, we're, it's going to take the perfect effort to win this game. Uh, SEC is pretty wide open. Uh, I would say about team two to team 13, pretty much anybody can beat anybody else on any given night. Hey, uh, one football thing for you. SEC Mike has sure. his uh, win totals for SEC teams next year. He had A&Ms at seven. Uh, I understand why people would not be high. Uh, A&M has burned no, those predictions out there. No, but I, no, they got to be no, higher no, than no, seven, no. right, A.T.? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe they're the only team in the league that doesn't play Georgia or Bama. Am I right on that? You guys don't play either one. Nope. I believe. Nope. And if, um, there we, you go. But they do get Notre Dame. They do get uh, Missouri. Right. They do get Texas. They do get LSU. Luckily, all of those are at home, but they do get them all. What about Ole Miss? You, guys play, you don't play Ole Miss this no, year, right? No, Ole Miss. And Ole Miss looks pretty nasty this year. Yes. So first of all, I, I I don't I didn't see this, but I would I would buy the over. Listen, we know what's about. Keep kind of waiting and healthy. We get all that. But but you know, it's funny as the season ended, you start to kind of look at next year and do the way through the top twenty five stuff, and you look at schedules. And I think as far as the SEC is concerned, Texas A and M has about as as manageable of a schedule as you can possibly have. Something that we just discussed. So I I, I actually would put that number. Higher than seven. What he says, seven, seven and five. Yeah, I would definitely put that number higher than that. Um, I'd have to look at everybody's schedule, but looking at those top teams, I think you could argue Texas a and M has the most manageable out of really maybe anybody in the league. So yeah, I don't know who this guy is, but you send him my way. You, you tell Forrest says that uh, they're going, they're going at least eight and four. Although I've said every year for like the last nine years that I expect them to be better than the prognosticators say, and they haven't been. But I also do think this is a new era. I do like the schedule. I'm taking them over seven wins, Dave. Mark it down on January 25th, 2024. How about that? AT, I'll, that. I'll tell you this, man. If you look at Texas, uh, University of Texas schedule, they have some marquee names on their sure. schedule, but they have a pretty easy schedule, my, I think. They're not getting the real Michigan team, right? They are, they are not. And, <laughs> and Georgia has to go to Austin, right? So you look at that. Now, sure. now Texas does have to go to Michigan, but I still don't think – it's going to be the Michigan team that we all expect. You've got that, and then you've got, uh, you know, you always have Oklahoma on your schedule. you got Vandy. you got Florida. you got Arkansas. Like, you got Kentucky. Like, I, I mean, I think that's a very manageable schedule, even with two marquee names in there. Well, really quick, I mean, you say you always have Oklahoma, but they catch Oklahoma on a neutral, so they have one less true road game in league play than everybody else in the league. And Oklahoma has... I believe one more one. Well, they have one more true road game than Texas does. But Texas has, I believe, only three true road games. If I'm not mistaken on that, because Oklahoma counts as a road game, so the schedule breaks very nicely for them. You know, even like a road game against Arkansas, I know it's a hated rival, and that place is going to be rocking. But Arkansas is probably the least talented team besides Vanderbilt in the league going into next year. So no, Texas, it, it, it actually does break pretty nicely. And then, like you said, Michigan is going to be. As the kids say, a great helmet game. I don't know how competitive it's going to be based on everything Michigan will do. So, again, you start to look at those schedules. Yeah, I'll do this real quick. I know we got to go. It's going to be no different than the NFL going forward in the Big Ten and the SEC. It is going to be who do you play, when do you play them, what time of year, uh, who's healthy, who's not. It's just going to be such a different world that we're entering next year. Part of me is excited, but the sport is going to look so different. I think this last two-minute conversation is really reflective of that. AT, appreciate you. Got to go. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thank you, David. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, we'll hit a break here. We'll come back with one final segment in the 9 o'clock hour, then Logan, then uh, we got Pat Bradley, we got the fan show, we got loaded load 10. We'll be back.
Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, let me read this. This is from Sam Mann on the YouTube chat. He's a Texas fan. Nice guy. He says, uh, at Michigan, OU, Georgia, at Arkansas, at A&M is tougher schedule than what A&M has. Well, I think we don't know any rosters, final rosters just yet, okay? But you're not, you're, yes, going to Michigan, as of right now, Michigan is not the same Michigan team. So please, let's, let's stop there. Georgia coming to town, very tough game. No doubt about that. At Arkansas, bro, come on. Come on, man. I, honestly, David, I'm going to take Sandman's side here. No, I, I agree that it, no matter what Michigan looks like, that's going to be a tough game. Going up north to play in the big house, that's tough. Uh, OU, rivalry game, that always goes that's wacky. That's every year. Like that's, I know, but it's still still difficult. Georgia coming to town, that's obviously the toughest game on that slate. At Arkansas, I agree with you, that's laughable. Uh, and coming here to A&M, which is going to be, you know, the – the first game back in the in the rivalry, and who knows what's going to happen in that one. But top, I'm with Sandman, though. Top 10 teams in Notre Dame, in Texas, and who else? Um, potentially LSU and Missouri. At least that's how the... So if we're basing it off part of the rosters from last year, come on, guys. Let's... You guys got Vandy. I mean, come on. Vamos a parar, okay? We'll hit a break. We'll come back with Logan Lee next on Tex X.
Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. This is a fact. If you could hear some of the conversations during the break, some of it would be like, why the heck are you guys talking about that? It's not interesting. But if you could see the passion behind some of our conversations, Logan Lee, people would be like, that's a good reality show. No, that's not a good reality show. No, no because if, it were, if, if we were on a reality show, We'd pe- have frosted tips. people would get hurt. Because on reality show, there's really no holding back. Here, you got to hold back. It's true. If, if we were on a reality show, people would get hurt. We wouldn't, we wouldn't get hurt. No. <laughs> hurting people. But, but people would get hurt. Am I right to believe? I think I've seen a picture. I might be wrong here, oh, but I'm no. sure at some point in your life you had frosted tips. No, Brandon Leone. Oh, I knew that. That, we got that, a picture that of was that. Brandon Leone. You I never, never, had, I frosted never had frosted tips. Now, bleach. Uh, I when I was little, I was towhead. Like I was blonde, blonde. Okay, like, but that's that's just your hair. But it wasn't. I was about to say it wasn't because I dyed it. Yeah, that was just you. That was just that was just me. But. You've seen pictures of long hair, but you've never seen me having dyed hair. So never. Never. No bleach, no dye. You know, uh, there was one summer where we, we put... Sun in. Was it lemon juice? Yeah. Yeah. It's like sun in. Yeah. We, did, we did that. We, we put lemon juice, but it didn't, really didn't do much. Makes it a little orange. I, I felt kind of weird yeah. putting lemon juice in my hair. You think our audience is enjoying this conversation right now? Uh, yeah, probably, I think, I think so. so. I think, yeah, I think you know they watch the look, view and they watch Texas. Look, <laughs> look, it's ten o'clock on a Thursday. Everybody knows that I'm gonna be here, so they take their break. <laughs> we we've, we've got three people listening right now, and they are enjoying this conversation, and we're good well, to go. There we go. So, I I. I I go through these like emotions with Aggie basketball or all Aggie sports, right? Where I'm very critical of a win, like that is, they, they wouldn't have beat another team like that. And then I get to a point <laughs> where like, because that's what I go, like I'm just being very honest. That's how my brain works. And then I'm like, hey, it's the SEC. A win is a win. So I'm all over the place. I felt really good about LSU. Did not feel great about Missouri, but I like winning. So that part's good. So where are you with Aggie basketball considering the last couple of wins? I'm, I'm the same. Look, and and I think I, I've I was able to come to a conclusion after the Missouri game is that whether I like the offense that they run, whether I like the defense that they play, it it doesn't it doesn't matter. I like winning, and if they win, they win, and and I'm okay with that. I don't like losing to LSU in the season opener. I don't like losing at Arkansas to an zero and three team. I don't like being an 0 and 5 team not handily just shaky. Yeah. I don't like that but after they they didn't score for 10 minutes, but they won. Yeah. Can can you really can you really complain like can you complain about that? No, I think we forecast what that would look like against Alabama, against Ole Miss, again that's what ends up happening, but you can't copy and paste the game plan for future opponents. Look, would would you rather would you rather Beat Missouri in in the fashion that they beat them that they year. beat them, whether it was last year or this year, or would you rather lose to Arkansas? They played similar in those games. Yeah, I, I take it and they and they won day. and yeah. and it, it it was it was a win. So we can criticize every like if you wanted to break it down, we can criticize every single play, even the plays that they score, even even the plays that they they get a stop on defense or six offensive rebounds in a possession, whatever it may be, we can still criticize what I don't even it think, is. I don't even think it's criticized for me. I think it's just like there's this level of expectation I had that I have had to readjust, right? And that's maybe the why. Like, and but that, I, don't, I don't know. If, I don't know. if I, And, and I, under, I completely understand what you're saying about readjusting your expectations because the team is different. You know, there's no Julius Marble. Boots was injured. Solo was, wasn't playing. Uh, Henry was injured. Like, they haven't had really a full squad the entire season. So you've had to readjust the whole thought process of four out of the six top players are returning. Well, not, that's not really true right. in, in regards to who's on the court. So you do have to readjust, but I don't think my readjustment has been accurate. If you look at the way Buzz develops his teams throughout the year, he needs consistency. Yeah, He needs consistency in, in, in the lineup, and you saw what happened when he doesn't have consistency. Look at the COVID year. Right. Yep. There was no consistency, and they did not play well. 
They they just they they didn't. And uh, but now I feel as if they are are trending. Getting they are trending. There's an uptick to to what's happening, and maybe that's my hope. Yeah. Maybe that's because every year that Buzz has been here, the second half of the season has been better. I was going to say almost phenomenal, but yes, better because there, there have been a couple of that, that weren't phenomenal, but better. They continue to grow. And so maybe that's we're going off of, of past history. Of, but that's of all we have. What, right? what, what, what can we expect? But again, those are just expectations. If you look at the roster, they're doing well with what they have. Shh. Who can score? Just wait. Tyrese is struggling. Yeah. And the reason he's struggling is because there's no post presence. Mm. Without a without a post on the block, all defense can is help side. And and Tyrese hasn't been able to get to the bucket as easy as as he usually has a the opportunity to do. And, and he, he looks better. He's getting there. I don't know what was going on. He 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 struggled with with that injury. He he struggled, and you could see in his play yeah. and his performance, and in in the minutes that he was getting, he's getting back to that to the level he was at. But outside of those two, who scores? I think when Boots is a little better, and Henry is a little better, and Henry started the season really hot, mm-hmm. Wade is significantly better because his shooting recently is starting to be yep. Wade esque, and that's because he's got his wingmen yep. contributing again. Well, he's got he he's got boots there, but also if Anderson Garcia can get a double double, this team is is infinitely better. If Solo can play uh, longer than fifteen minutes without fouling, <laughs> he, this team is infinitely better. Yeah, you know, just putting in their one two two to slow teams down. If you put Solo at the top with his wingspan, his athletic ability. That that accounts for one and a half turnovers, and if you get that one and a half turnover, and it turns it into an easy bucket, all of a sudden, when the team gets down and they break the press, now they're at twenty one seconds, and that's what it's made for. But when he's on the bench, they don't have that. So there's there's a lot of things that that play into it. Sure. That. Everybody just has to get on the same page, and that's what Buzz is good at doing He's is getting his team on the same page. It may take a little longer than everybody wants them to, but So in it's readjusting okay. your expectations, this is still a tournament team with a chance to go to the Sweet 16? I think right now at this point the Sweet 16 is tough. I, I, it, it just is. Just the way that they're playing, they need to find somebody else that can score. They, they need to... They need to... Personally, I think they need to pick up their defense. Uh, they, Which I feel like they did in the Missouri game for that stretch. For that stretch, yeah. they did. But it can't be a, a, against, against everybody. It can't be just that stretch. It's, it's got to be the entire game. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's the goal, 40 minutes. You play 40 minutes. If they play 40 minutes, defense like, like they did in that stretch and the offensive rebounding and Wade's making some shots, they're a tough team to stop. But if they're not... They can lose to anybody. Do you... Okay, you know basketball a million times more than I do. Do you have a problem with a team that's not very good from shooting the three, shooting as many threes as this team shoots? I forget the number, 321st in, co- in college basketball, whatever it may be. That being said, when it's in the flow of the offense and there's an open look, and you got guys you trust that can hit them, you got to let them shoot them. I, I don't want to say I have a problem with it. I don't like it. But, you know, Buzz has been doing this for over two decades. He knows his team. He knows his roster. There's a reason why they are doing what they're doing. That may be the best option that they have right now. I get frustrated when they don't run a set play, when, when, when it's just a, a ball screen or a ghost screen, and, and they're just trying to play off of, off of reaction. I I feel like they need some some structure and some discipline in some of the play calls and some of the sets that they have. But that's not my choice. I mean, Buzz is with them every day. Yeah, He's in practice with them every day. He sees what this team does, and I'm, there's no way that I'm going to say I'm smarter than he is when it comes to his, his team players, and, yeah. and coaching what it is. Like that's, that's his job. That's his livelihood. So he's going to do the best, and that may be the best that they have right now. Which, by the way, 
if I trusted him before the season and the season before that because of his track record, yeah. I got to trust him now Absolutely. because he has a track record of, all right, this isn't working. Let's mold it and do this. And there, there's a reason his teams do get better, which goes back to your original point. His teams need consistency, yep. and they've been robbed of that for big parts of this season. And, and here's, here, here's, another, here's another factor that, that we have to really think about. Everything that Buzz does for his team, it's implemented step by step, game by game, practice by practice. That's why he always talks about this was their first rep at, the, at this option, or this was, their, this was only their second rep, or look how well they did. It was their fourth rep. They know, right. what, they know what it is. So he is a very process-oriented coach. And sometimes games like Missouri – it's the first step, or really, it could be games like Arkansas. There was he he implemented something, and then it went to LSU, and they took the next step, and then they went to Missouri, and they took the next next step. And so you you may not notice all the changes that he's making because it's very gradual. And so this next game, they may come out and be like, "Wow, that that looks like a different team," but it's because they've been working on it since Arkansas. Mm-hmm. It, he's he has a process, and you you've got to you've got to trust what he's doing because why would you not he's done it everywhere he's been and his team has gotten better with every game throughout the second half of the season every single year so why not now yeah Uh, and that's until it doesn't happen and then if it doesn't happen then you start questioning what 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 was different this year yeah and and, and to me maybe it is a question it's more of an observation like wow we're not very good at shooting threes like i agree uh, uh, but we're so good at getting rebounds and this is the other thing that I think I need to give them credit for. For a long time, they did not get easy buckets. They got transitional points against Missouri. I got to give them the props that they deserve there. And, and I think, you know, I, I've been asking, why, why are they not pushing the ball? They, they've got to play faster. That, that's, mm-hmm. They have the talent to do so. I mean, think about is, is Solo better in the open court receiving a lob, or is he better in the half court? Right. Is Jace Carter a better shooter in the half court or when they're on, on either transition or secondary where they kick it out, Wade drives, gets his foot in the paint, kicks it out, and he's just firing it up in the secondary break? Is Boots better in transition? Is Wade better in transition? Henry Coleman, even though he's, he's, he's a bigger guy for this team, he never posts up. He no. doesn't. What is, what he is faces he? up and he tries to beat yeah, you with speed or strength. It, exactly, from the high post. But put him in transition or let him start the break. He's really good at that. Let, then kick, kick it out a, ahead and, and let them go. Like, are they better in that type of game, in that style of game, or in the half-court set? I think they're better playing fast. Yeah, me too. But again, it's steps, and, and we saw that in Missouri. I don't know why they went away from it. It's, it's one of those things where you play a team like LSU where you don't want to get in a track meet. You play a team like Arkansas where you don't want to get into a track meet with them because they are so talented and that's what they want to do. So you slow it down in those games. And then all of a sudden it's, well, we slowed it down that game and we won. Or we right. slowed it down in this game and we were successful. So let's slow it down. Don't, don't lose yourself. Get into it. Mix it up a little. And I think that's what Buzz is going to do is he's going to mix up that transition, those transition points with the half-court sets. Follow me here. This is maybe this is a natural comparison, but I'm going to make it for different reasons. I remember looking at Dexter and thinking, that guy looks like an NBA player. And he, I think, is living up to that, right? He's had yep. some success at the G League and at the NBA level. I look at uh, Jace Carter. Not the same, but there is something about his size, his, and he's starting to get a little bit more comfortable. I'm like, I feel like if he continues the trend in the direction we've seen over the last three, four games, I think this guy could really be what we expected him to be that he hadn't hit yet. He's starting to get to there. Am, am I right? I think so. I think that comes with, with repetition and with confidence. I, st- I still look at his shot every time he shoots the ball, his follow-through, his form. I'm like, how does that not go in? It looks like, how, how, do, how does it not go in yeah. every time he, he fires it up? Because it is the same every single time. Now, he just hasn't, he hasn't made enough of those, and he hasn't proven that that he is the shooter that we thought he was coming into the season. But I do think every time he makes one of those, he gains more and more confidence, and you will see a better Jace Carter three games from now. I think so, too. Now, um, I, I, don't, I, don't think he, I don't think he looks like a pro like Dexter Dennis did. 
No, but I think he he looks like there's something there. But he looks, yeah, absolutely. He looks the part. He is a puzzle piece. And if and if he can make two to three threes a game, that changes this offense exponentially. I mean, if if he's averaging six a game right now, if he could get closer to nine. Again, of course, one extra bucket. I think he's good for one extra bucket. A guy who struggled, who this at the beginning part of the year, he was like, it was a delightful surprise to see Hayden Hefner do so well. What did I see? Two for 20-something on threes uh, to start SEC play, something low like that. I like him attacking more than I like him shooting. And I think even you told me his freshman year, like, that's what he did in high school. He yeah. attacked more than he spot up, he's a spot-up shooter. Yeah, but I think the trouble, the trouble with with Hefner and the position is the positions that he's been put into. Look at the shots that he's been firing up. There, There's not, again, we go back to the sets. I'd, I'd like to see some more discipline and some more structure to some of those sets and a play call. Hey, have Hef run the baseline, receive two, receive two screens by, by the bigs, yep. catch the ball, free throw line extended and fire it up. Or in the zone, you know, spot him up between the corner and, and the free throw line extended, get the ball to the high post, reverse it, maybe skip pass over to him, let him fire it up. Let him catch and not have to have a defender in his face or there's five seconds on the shot clock, I've got to fire it up, right, I, right, wh- right. whatever it is. He, he needs a little extra half second to get his shot ready. That That's just what he needs right now, and he hasn't gotten that in the last – Four games, five games. Let's do this. Let's look at what they have upcoming and just kind of the urgency. Um, and look, they're almost wins. That's you got to look at them. But <laughs> yeah, right. Like Ole Miss is a team that isn't, isn't living up to their potential at the moment. And they had a very easy non-conference, but still a dangerous opponent. You've got to win a bunch of these next. I mean, not just a bunch. I, it'd be amazing because I think you're back on track if you can get to Tennessee without a loss. But you can't say that with this team. O- Ole Miss. <sighs> I, I think everything's gonna be every game's gonna be tough for them. Yeah, just because not not because of A and M, but because of the way SEC is. You look at all of these teams. Ole Miss could have a good night, and and they could play really well. They have talent. They they could play really well, mm-hmm. but they haven't. I mean, they, like you said, they're neither had Arkansas. Their non conference was trash. Right. <laughs> I mean, it was it, trash. It just yeah. it just wasn't good. Uh, so who knows what happens when. They get punched in the face a couple times, and do they respond? A and M needs to throw those punches. They need to throw some haymakers and and come out come out of the gates instead of spotting their opponent ten points. Come out and put them and put their opponent in a hole in ten points, and and with that defense, and see what happens. Yeah. Like if you get if you get your opponents on their heels and they have to change their game plan, and you just keep playing your defense, then it changes the game. But they've been playing from behind. In every game that they've had, For every game going all the way back to Iowa State, not too bad in Kentucky, but everything else has been like yeah. all, all the major games. Yeah, for like, sure. Yeah. U of H, uh, Iowa State, they're all major holes. They're like, here, guys, I'm gonna spot you 15 points because I want a challenge. No, it, it, no, let's make the challenge for them. Exactly. That 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 is that is a bigger frustration for me than anything else. Is just get off to a good start. And then see what happens. See how that changes the momentum and the, and the atmosphere and, and your feeling about being alive in that game. Yeah. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. When we come back, Pat Bradley is going to be joining us from the SEC Network. Right now, you can make the decision right now to get lasting relief from that awful joint pain here in 2024. Do not go another year compromising because of that pain in your knee or your shoulders out there. Call QC Kinetics, and they are the nation's leader in regenerative medicine. They've been helping out people all over the Brazos Valley. Uh, It's a non-surgical pain relief, the leader in doing all of that, folks. Uh, Your body has what it needs to restore and repair that damaged joint tissue, and QC Kinetics can make it happen for you. No drugs, no surgery, no downtime. The future of pain treatments are right here in the Brazos Valley. It has arrived, and they've got tens of thousands of satisfied patients all over the United States. People with back pain, hip pain, any pain associated with arthritis out there, and it's not a Band-Aid. The best part of it is, yeah, you'll feel better for a day. No, no, you're going to feel better moving forward. Revolutionary treatment can get you moving once again. Get your life back, and it is non-surgical, which is the best part of it all. This is the year that you fight back and you win, and you get your life back. Call QC Kinetics for a free consultation. Put it on the calendar immediately, 979 452 
QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That is 979-452-6000. All right, we're back. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go straight to the uh, Brian Foley Law Hotline. Pat Bradley from the SEC Network joining us here on the program. Pat, good morning. How are you, sir? Hey, good. How you guys doing? Wonderful, man. Uh, my, my question for you is a simple one. Have you figured out this Texas A&M team yet, this basketball team? Logan Lee was just on a moment ago, and we he, he's a former player. He played for Buzz before when he was an assistant for Billy Gillespie. And his thought was like, this is kind of what Buzz does. He kind of figures out his team as the year goes on. Is that what you're seeing from this A&M team? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, going into the season, they, they obviously, you know, picked to be in the, in the mix to win the SEC. And a lot of that had to do with the returners. You know, you, you just, you don't have the luxury of, bringing back um, as many guys that played meaningful minutes as Texas A&M. Now, the issue with Julius Marble, uh, what's going on? Do you guys know what's going on? Is he coming back, or is it uh, we, we, done deal? We, I, don't, I, I haven't done any work. I don't, I don't think he's coming back. It's a university issue, so I, I, I don't think he will come back. But, you know, at this point, you can't really count on it. Right, okay. Well, you know, obviously he was a big piece of the puzzle, but you bring back Wade Taylor, obviously preseason SEC player of the year, and Coleman, Radford, who I know, you know, a little injury early on. Um, 
So you can bring back a good core nucleus to work with, like guys you can depend on. And, you know, one of the things I said around Christmas time was, you know, the hopes for this team was to find balanced scoring. And, you know, Wade Taylor, as great as he is, putting up, you know, 40 and big just on the road at home, whenever it is, you know, you know that at some point someone, you know, there's going to be other guys are going to have to step up and give, give uh, something in the scoring column because he just does so much. Um, but they're just so well coached. And I think, you know, um, Coach Williams has got so many things, whether it's defensive, you know, he switches up his defense just enough to put the offense on their heels, to slow them down, um, to get it going at their pace. So I think those little things, you know, can keep them in every game. Um, and the fact that, listen, when you're not making shots, what else can you do? And, and they can go and get a couple of offensive rebounds and stick back better than anyone in the country. So, um, you know, I, I think I think they're in great shape right now. Talking to Pat Bradley here on Tex Ags Radio. You mentioned Wade Taylor. He's had some huge moments this year, as we've come to expect. He had a lot of accolades coming into the season. Do you think he's lived up to those accolades, even with some of the shooting slumps that he had early on? It seems like he's kind of found his his rhythm once again. Oh, there's no doubt. And, and the reason why he's considered um, the SEC Player of the Year is because there's not another guy in the SEC that affects more of the game than him. You know, you'll have... For instance, the kid Dalton connects is a heck of a player at Tennessee. He's a great scorer, great scorer. But you don't have any he, – Wade Taylor is number two in scoring, number seven in assists, number three in steals. He just has an impact on every part of the game. And that's that, – there's not another player you – know, you look at Mark Sears at Alabama um, – who's similar because he can score and what he's done this year has facilitated a lot more for that offense. But that's why Wade Taylor is unique because it's, it's, you know, he's a setup man. He's a scorer. He's a defender. Um, and, and that's really what separates him. So, you know, you can get caught up in the stats, but it's really his presence on the floor of orchestrating everything. That's the most important. Pat, how close do you think the second tier of the SEC is this year like you know obviously you got your top dogs and then you got just a, a few teams right there in the middle they're in striking distance and they're all fighting for that second tier spot if you will yeah it is and, and it's going to be a fun SEC tournament it really is going to be a, a, an exciting SEC tournament um you know you because you have you know Tennessee obviously another veteran team coming back um you know cont- A&M is sort of I know there was maybe um, you know, a little bit of bumps, but I, I think they're trending back towards the top of the SEC along with Kentucky with all that talent. Uh, and then you got, you know, you know, we got projected eight or nine teams in the SEC tournament. So, you know, you look at Mississippi State, another veteran team, any one of these guys, it looks like Tennessee, I think, is going to maybe emerge with Auburn as well. And that's another veteran team. You know, you put them right at the top. Auburn, I got them in Mississippi State uh, on Saturday. Auburn's a heck of a team, heck of a team. Um, so I think it's 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 going to be a mess. Who emerges out of that? Um, you know, good luck. <laughs> I mean, that's it. It could be anybody. I, I I feel like you know, Vandy, Arkansas, unfortunately, is on the slide. So you know, those two teams have got to, you know, they got to pick it up here before time runs out. Speaking of uh, Arkansas, your former team, just uh, outside of the A&M game, what's been the biggest issue? And, they, you know, they have they've struggled to find somebody who they, they transfer a portal. They brought in a lot of guys, in much like a lot of coaches did, that hit the portal hard over the season. They try to bring in what their weakness was. Last year didn't have a lot of shooters. You know, they, they didn't have a lot of straight scores. So Coach Musk brings in um, about three, four guys who, you know, were their team's leading scorer uh, the, uh, off the previous season. But what they lacked was, um, you know, really a lead guard, somebody that set them up. Last year, I don't know if you guys remember Anthony Black. As a freshman, kids, you know, he was that ideal guy. We talked just talked about Wade Taylor. You look at Tennessee with Zakai Ziegler and even uh, the kid Vescovy plays some point guard. So. I mean, I think that's been the biggest issue with Arkansas. Is it's been so much one-on-one, 
and that's just, you know, the kind of DNA. I don't think they're unselfish guys. I just think they, they don't have anybody, you know, point out a true lead guard to uh, facilitate their offense and get them going. Pat, I really appreciate your time here on the program. Look uh, forward to seeing you there on the SEC Network and ESPN. Hope to do it again, all right? All right, fellas, anytime, man. Talk to you soon. Take care. Pat Bradley there on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Appreciate his analysis. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with the fan show, guys. Right now, Millican Reserve, Farm to Table Community. Did you know they're in Cottle Station and in Navasota, featuring homes, trails, farms, and wide open spaces with a mission to build a healthy community around nature, and they've done that by creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community. They're dedicated to that conservation of a healthy community. You go out there, you just want to be outdoors. You just want to enjoy it. Uh, obviously, not when it's raining, but when it's, it's good weather, that is the place to go. Throw the ball with your kids. Just go for a nice little walk and, and connect with your family. They've done a great job with those uh, network of trails throughout a wooded landscape. They got the walking paths, they got the equestrian paths, they've got the creeks, they got the ponds, they got the gathering areas. It's a place for families to cherish for generation after generation. And you can find all the animals you want. Uh, you know, those preserved woods has got it all. They got white tailed deer, they got songbirds, they got rabbits, they got turtle turtles. And homeowners at Millican Reserve share a legacy of conservation, which means generation after generation, you're coming back to that pristine countryside place. You got to go check it out and enjoy it all. Check out the website, MillicanReserve.com. Again, that is MillicanReserve.com. Com.
Welcome back in Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. A quick moment for Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. Don't replace it, lift it. Uh, you can call them up at 979-933-8527. They are Aggie owned and operated. If you've got any issues with concrete at your house, I'm talking about like your driveway is jacked, your patio is jacked, let them fix it because they can fix it at half the cost of replacement. Replacement can cost you anywhere from 10 to 15 grand. You don't want to spend that. You want to do it for a fraction of that cost. Brian Dickerson, he's an Aggie and he gets it d- done for you. Again, that phone number, 979- 979-933-8527, local, state, and nationwide. Uh, they'll take care of you residentially. They'll take care of your commercial business, factory floors, apartment complexes, and, of course, industrial, municipal, roads, streets, highways, you name it, they will do it for you. Follow them on Facebook or on Instagram or call them up at 979-933-8527. Again, don't replace it. Lift it. All right, folks, it's time for the Tech Fan show brought to you by Gerard Construction, custom home builders for the Brazos Valley. I see you, Roy. They don't just build homes, they build relationships. Learn more at Gerard Construction.com. Stephen Elder in the house. Hello, Stephen. Howdy, howdy. In a minute. And uh, Roy May. Hello, sir. Still singing the intro, huh? Every once in a while. I, I, it, pres- it feels I appreciate good. that. I feel out of place. I'm like, I'm not in the right chair. You're usually there. I know. I, f- I feel like I'm literally in a different studio. Well, Stephen gave me the stiff arm. switch, or are you good? We might have to switch a break. I don't <laughs> okay. know. We'll, we'll take this first segment and see how it goes. <laughs> well, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center because Callie Gardner is going to start us off with the opening question. Callie? Mike, part two. Arr! We're back. I didn't learn from my mistake. All good. It happens. How are y'all? Doing great. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Happy to have y'all here. We'll start with you, Roy. Uh, what's on your mind? Tell us what you're thinking this morning. Oh, man. You, you, I, like, did, you I did the you old co- switcheroo. You, you contracted that out. I, I'm going to um, take the segment off, guys. We'll see you later. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, so what's on my mind? Wait, well, wait, wait, You appreciate that? You're glad I'm leaving? Yes, 100%. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, well, yeah, I'll switch into that chair, actually. Um, you can do it. <laughs> you've done it. <laughs> yeah, not well. Um, so what's on my mind? I, what's on my mind is that I, I wake up every morning with a song stuck in my head. Um, but, so that's, I literally, I can't get it out this morning. It's the long and winding road by the Beatles. Um, but uh, what's on my mind is, is basketball. All right. And, and I understand there's a ton of momentum right now, um, or at least maybe cautious optimism with football. And I get that. Um, but, uh, but right, like we're in the here and now and here and now is basketball, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Aggie basketball. Uh, you asked an interesting question. I can't remember who the guest was, but you're like, can you put a, can, can you put your thumb on this team? Like, what is this team? Um, and I asked that same question a couple of days ago. Like, I, just, I have no idea, uh, you know, what the men's team is is doing right now. Um, but they've got a great opportunity with a handful of, of home games. Um, they've won three of their last four conference games. Uh, so I think we're starting to see that, again, that turn in the season that we've seen out of the buzz teams. Mm-hmm. There, where you see the success and, and you see things starting to uh, kind of things getting figured out. Um, and, I, and I've heard a lot of, how does he not have it figured out because it's the same team? Uh, but it's not without Marble. You know, this is, it's a completely different setup. And without, without Dexter. And without, yeah, without Dexter. Um, and, and it's, it, there's a great opportunity ahead of them, um, but they've absolutely got to seize it, having these, you know, handful of home games. Um, but on the flip side, I'm really excited about women's basketball. And I understand that they got demolished by South Carolina, but South Carolina is going to win the national championship unless they literally. They should have won last year. Yeah, unless they literally, the entire team gets the flu. Um, like, that's the only way South Carolina is going to. That has actually happened to yeah. the A&M football team. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, or if it ends up, you know, with injuries like, a, like women's basketball last year, where at one point they had six people, like, total to play a game. <laughs> right. Um, which is like a YMCA pickup league kind of depth. Um, and so, uh, but I'm excited about what Joni's doing and, um, and I understand that, that what happened, I, I thought that the way they started again, they started and you're like, this is like men's basketball and you know, the other team is going to score the first 15 points and then we'll see how things go. But, um, I thought they pulled back. I thought they fought well. And, you know, and the detractors that say, you know, well, South Carolina put in their bench, South Carolina's bench could, could challenge for the SEC title. All right. South Carolina's depth is completely insane. So I'm excited on both ends of the spectrum for for uh, for basketball, both men's and women, uh, men and men and women. Um, I I think this is kind of the point where we know where Buzz turns it around. You you you'd like to see it not have to turn around. Sure. You'd, you'd like to see the team not have to fight back in these games. You know, like what a great surge. Well, you know, maybe you don't expend as much effort if you just <clears throat> if you remember that the whistle starts when it starts, and that's when the game starts. Um, but I'm excited for both sides of basketball. Uh, uh, I, I really am. I, I, I think the women, and they talked about it on the broadcast during the South Carolina game, you know, who's that third team that can really start to step up uh, in the SEC? And, and they really mentioned A&M. And, and, the, and the commentators were like, hey, what are you going to do when it's South Carolina, right? I mean, they're going to – we stopped them from scoring 100. You know, they're an amazing team, amazing depth. Uh, uh, Don Staley is, is such a great coach. 
um, and what she's been able to build there. But they they really talked about what Joni Taylor's building, and you have to re- realize like Joni Taylor's resume is insane, right? And so I'm excited about what's happening on both sides uh, of, of basketball, both men and women program, uh, men men and women's programs, um, and then you know. We're, we're getting real close to Aggie baseball and softball. Yeah, you softball, know it. Softball, softball is starts. Here. Yeah, sauce and, and and softball starts on the ninth and Trish the is Aggie classic. Too, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm. Yeah, I know we all want all the success to be in the fall and we want national championships. And we want to win in football, but there are so many other great programs: golf and tennis. Yep. Um, there's so many great programs in the spring. So it's spring's always exciting to be an Aggie. Like it's, it's, it's there's so much momentum and and so much fun. And um, I, I'll, I'll tell you this: like, watch out for softball this year. I'm, I'm gonna kind of like I'll, you feel about about uh, Aggie women's basketball. You feel the same way about softball. Uh, Aggie women's basketball maybe next year. Okay, I think Joni's maybe a year behind where Trisha was. It was the non-conference. <clears throat> let's learn how to win first. Yep. You know, and, and I and I like that approach. Let's learn how to win, and then let's get into the meat of our schedule. Um, I think Trisha Ford has got something going on over Davis time this year. Mr. Elder, what, what's on your mind? Man, this is kind of random, but I'm, I'm excited for Dan Campbell. Yeah. <laughs> not random? I, well, not random. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just a big fan, and I'm excited to see him take on the Niners. I think it's perfect for who he's built the team to be and their mindset. And I don't know. I just, I'm kind of vicarious of living through his excitement. I mean, yeah. I just, Didn't the guy great. fires me up. Isn't he great? Yeah. He's, I mean, and it's cool that he's like, I don't know. He's just, he feels like he, sh- it feels like he should be here at some point. But I mean, I just, I, I dream about him. On the sideline, at and I'm, that's but but I'm also excited about Aggie men's basketball. I feel like I feel like the momentum's picking up. Yep, <clears throat> I feel like there's some like. But why can't they put out an official word on Julius <laughs> Marvel? I mean, because it's a university issue. One of my buddies was like, "They're saying on the boards that he's going to play tonight." It was this on Tuesday? And I'm like, "Yeah," but it, I just wish they would put out an official statement so we could all stop talking about it. Um, but <laughs> well, if he if he comes back, I mean, I don't, know, he's not coming back. Like if he nah. if, if he's not back now, it, it ain't happening. So I think the momentum though is building. I think Buzz is doing what he does, and it, for whatever reason, why he does it this way, or why the, they do it this way, they just come on stronger middle of January or whatever. I, I mean, they did they've done the past what two years, right? It's aggravating. Yeah. It's <laughs> aggravating, but I mean that's just who they are. Well, um, but I think he uh, and Logan talked about this in the opening segment. It's all about consistency with that team. Yeah, and. People, the rhythm. <clears throat> Again, you can't have guys in and out of your lineup. Guys that you expected to start yeah. and be, and then when they come back, they're not themselves just yet. That's what we saw right. with Henry, and that's yeah. what we saw with Boots. But well, I think too, though, the way Buzz has built the program, I think there are some guys that will rise up. I think, and you were talking about just a little while ago. Uh, I mean, who who was the guy you were talking about just a little while ago? I'm excited about Carter. Carter, Jace Carter yeah. yeah, Jace Carter. So I mean, there's some guy, and like Anderson Garcia, I think he is a spark plug, and every time he's on the court, I mean, people just react to how he he's plays. He's like a nuclear reactor. That's uh, He's just unbelievable. Yeah, they're fun to watch. So I think, I, think, I think they'll beat Ole Miss. I think it'll be a close game. But Ole Miss is feeling like they're having identity issues because they just got blown out in their last two of the last three games. So I'm excited for, for men's basketball. I'm, you know, I think we're going to start seeing some con- more consistency. Well, and Ole Miss is a good one because I think we are realizing that the reason they have the record they have is maybe because they loaded up on cupcakes sure. in the non-conference. They they didn't they really didn't play anybody. Man, we played kind of everybody. We yeah. did, and we did. And, and I'll say this: I I am a prisoner of the moment after a win and a loss. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. Yeah. This game, you, you, we're same, same, bro. same. Yeah. same. <laughs> this game here is going to tell me. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to tell me the whole season, but like this is such an opportunity to beat a team that is perceived to be good. If, mm. if they turn out to be as good as we thought, we'll see. As of right now, they're struggling. But it just continues that momentum. Like, all right, we had those hiccups, but here you are. Here's a little bit of proof. And we should have won the Arkansas game, too. Here's more proof that we're yeah. getting back to what we yeah, thought. Yeah, Arkansas was, man, that was it's Apparently, it's illegal to win at Bud Walton Arena. <laughs> yeah. But it's, again, like you said, you've got all the opportunity in front of you because you just beat Missouri. Um, kind of in just an absolute rock fight, like just lock two tigers inside of a telephone booth and see what happens, kind of thing. Um, no, no pun intended with the tiger thing, I guess. Uh, but you've got Old Miss, who because of their record, I think you can chalk this up as a good win if you can pull it off. Um, you've got Florida, who's struggling, um, and so then you can, and it's kind of one of those winners win, right? Mm-hmm. And and so if you can kind of rattle off a few wins, then you go on the road to Missouri, a team that you've already beat, um, and, and on, on a night that you've just played poorly, quite frankly. Except um, for a 10-minute stretch. Yeah, so yeah, so out of 40, that's not great. You know, I mean, that's 25% worse than our shooting percentage. <laughs> um, 
but then you, but then you get to come home. So if you can kind of rattle off three wins, and, and I know like winning is tough, I get it. Um, but if you can rattle off, three, but you should, you should, you should win these games. So if you can you rattle off three games. more, then you've got five in a row, and you've got Tennessee coming to town, and you want to talk about like I a prime TV be, slot. But I think that's pivotal. I mean, that if you can what put three out of the four next four wins. I mean, if you can win three out of the next four, big. I mean, and then Huge. you have Tennessee, and then you beat Tennessee. Talk about the confidence, momentum you have going into you know the rest of the season. I think it's yeah. I think it's a good time for them to kind of come on strong and continue to be consistent. Hey, let's hit a break here. We'll come back with more. It is the uh, fan show brought to you by Gerard Con- uh, Construction. Uh, Kelly is working. His guy's busy Gerard recently. Construction.com. There you go. Not just homes, relationships. They do build relationships. Have you noticed the relationships they've built? I've noticed. Yeah. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with some NFL thoughts next. Welcome back into Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. It's time to end the day with Double Dave's. Caller number 12, 979-693-1150. We'll hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's. Serving Ag Lance is 84. Double Dave's serving up your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls with reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDave's.com for your favorites, uh, and they'll be on their way. Why are you looking at me weird? Let's go to Double Dave's, Double Dave's. Yeah, keep, keep let's going. go. Keep no, going. No. 
By the way, it's the Fan Show presented by Gerard Construction, Ooh. where they uh, harmonize here on the program. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, Stephen, you start us off. Jim Harbaugh to the Chargers. Take Man, it from there. Man, it, it's, it's <clears throat> exciting to see what's going to happen. I am I don't saw some rumors about uh, Kelly from LSU potentially looking at the job. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I just heard rumblings. I think when a, when a major coach like that leaves, it creates this, like, suction and just people start, you know – I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think it's going to definitely rock <clears throat> college football in some way, kind of like Saban did, because, I mean, I don't know. It, it's exciting to see because <clears throat> it opens up new possibilities. For well, me. it does if that were to happen, more than likely they're, they're, BK <clears throat> going they're, there. They're promoting more. Sure on no. Yeah. If they weren't, weren't going to promote more, I think there would be more legs to the BK statement. Um, this is my take on it. I literally had this conversation with my wife last night, and my wife is she loves Aggie football, and she loves college football Saturdays, but she's not like tuned. She mm -hmm. doesn't look at recruiting. She doesn't care about the transfer portal, but she understands all of it. And and she got really in depth with with me too. I, I think it's absolute garbage trash because now the transfer window has opened for Michigan for these players for thirty days. They can't go anywhere. They can't go anywhere. Like, where are they going to enroll oh, right in now, the next yeah. 24 hours? Yeah, you basically got to decide now or wait till the spring. No, you should have decided last night, pretty yeah. much. And so, like, I hate it for the players because that rule is in place to protect the players. You know, if they came to a school for a coach and the coach leaves, like, I, I like that rule, that they're able to leave if, if their coach leaves. It's just the head coach. I get it. Like, if your position coach leaves, so be it. But it's happening in such a time frame that it's just complete crap for these Michigan players. The ones that are like, I don't want to play for more. I came here for a Harbaugh. Now, don't get me wrong. The Michigan roster is pretty much gutted anyways after this year because they were so top-heavy, you know, right. classification-wise. But it's just – it's such doo-doo how long it took for this to come about. And then, like, man, he's run into the NFL to avoid NCAA sanctions. And that's kind of how I feel about it. And, and that's fine. That's all and well. But, again, we find this in a, in a situation where – it's detrimental to maybe the players' futures. And, and I understand that there's a whole counter argument about people don't like NIL and they don't like the transfer. Like, I don't care if you like it or not, it's here to stay. And, and the idea behind all this was to support and help and provide for the players more so than we we're already doing. So that's fine if that's your argument, but that's the rule, man. But you know that this conversation is going to last forever because with the DH, I mean, sports radio has been doing it. Uh, should the American League get rid of the DH? You know, like how they've done with both leagues now. Um, that's been a conversation piece forever, and I feel like this is going to always be at least a sports radio. Are we about to argue about the DH? What about? It? I'm not saying that I, I have an opinion. I, you don't know where I, I, I might be a politician right now. Not, not, not I don't ever want to see a pitcher pick up a bat. It's a joke. <laughs> but have you not heard of that debate? No, on yeah, hundred. We've been listening sports to it radio for, for years. Yeah, I've, I've been listening. I've, I've heard that debate since literally I started hearing debates about sports. Is the D like the DH? Is, that's such a great example. This is why you're in that chair. Well, David. thank you very much. And See, you know now what? You're nice. Stay. You know what? Stay. Um, <laughs> you can use a stead with me. <laughs> not too. <laughs> but I, but it, but it, but it is what it is. And and so I I just I don't know, man. If you believe, I think I I, I don't know if I said this earlier. I, like if you believe in the whole the NFL is scripted then the Ravens are going to win the Super Bowl so we can hear the narrative that <laughs> the Harbaugh's won theories. it all. They did win it all. Like, if, if you're that guy. Um, but I personally, I don't really care. Um, I lived in San Diego. Couldn't stand the Chargers there. I can't stand the Chargers now. I don't care where they're at. I don't really care, like, personally. Where would you live in San Diego? I'm interested in this. Uh, oh, gosh. Um, this is good radio. La Costa. Uh -huh. um, yeah, right up past the golf resort. It was fantastic. Love San Diego. Um, Beautiful. But – uh, well, I tell you what, being an Army recruiter in San Diego for three years and come back to me about what you think about San Diego. Um, but uh, but I, I, I think it's crappy for the players, you know, yeah. the ones that would want to leave because of the timing of, of, of how it all worked out. Personally, him going to the Chargers doesn't move the needle for me because, again, you know, my stance on the Chargers is what it is. Lions or Niners, Stephen? I mean, the Ravens are the best team right now, but I think <clears throat> the, the situation – I mean, so I don't know if uh, – What's his face for the Niners is playing? Is he out still, the uh, receiver? Debo. Debo. I don't know if Debo's playing. If Debo's out, I think the Opens Lions the have a really good shot. And I, th I just believe Dan Campbell's got something special, and I think they all have bought in to Dan Campbell's philosophy, and it would be freaking awesome to see him go all the way to the Super Bowl. I mean, that would just be, like, the best. He, he avoided the, the question I asked. Though, what was the question? <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I didn't hear the I'm question. I'm a Cowboys fan, so I'm taking the Kidding. Lions. Uh, uh, I, th I think emotion, Lions. emotion says the Lions – um, because I hate the I mean, but, well, motion says not the Niners, 
But like you said, no, there, you there's something special brewing in Detroit Motor City, man. I hope so. And uh, regardless, Dan's having success. AG's having success. So awesome. Success all over the place. Josh Reynolds. Chiefs yeah, or Ravens? Um, Ravens. I mean, I just think they're on. I mean, the Chiefs are going to, you know, put up some drama. I, I don't. I think the Ravens are going to go all the way. Pat Mahomes, man. You should have lost in Buffalo. That dude just doesn't lose. So until he decides to lose, I'm, a, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking the. Well, weird, Lamar Jackson, I feel like taking Lamar Woody Jackson, Woodpecker from Texas Tech, his voice cracks me up, man. Mahomes can run and make plays, but Lamar Jackson, you can take away the the, the throw, and he's going to run until you just can't stop. I mean, he's unstoppable. You, yeah, well, so are the he's Chiefs. He's a offense. beast. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thanks for having us. Thank you to Gerard Construction Construction as well. That's going to do it for Tech Sacks tomorrow on the show. I know we got Billy. I know we got Mark French. I know we got Olin Buchanan. I don't know why I have this accent. But we've all that and much, much more. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you mañana.